Well, if you were listening last night on Coast to Coast AM with George Nori, you might have thought that I wouldn't have had a ghost of a chance of being on the air tonight. You might have heard my voice squawking out of me like some sort of raven or something. And you may have heard that and quoth nevermore. However, uh, it is uh, it is amazing what this uh, zerithra, zerithra, myosin, whatever it can do. And yes, it, in fact, I had uh, kind of uh, lost my voice a little bit yesterday and I was like, Thinking about, oh no, this is this is the ghost to ghost night. This is the big night. This is this is the chance where the understudy gets to star in Forty Second Street. And there was no way I was missing that. And fortunately for tonight too, this is the night when your calls are the stars. You are telling the stories tonight as we go ghost to ghost, uh, looking for the best ghost stories, true ghost stories. So, you know, it it, it will be um, incumbent on you to not only be truthful in these recollections, because that's what makes them so much more enjoyable, uh, but also to present the story well. So as we will look forward to getting to so many of your calls coming up tonight, just keep that in mind, that uh, you need to maybe give us the, you know, the zippy version of the story as opposed to Maybe presenting it around the campfires you usually do might take on two or three acts. Uh, you know, get to the good part soon, as quickly as possible. Introduce as little as you need to introduce, and then and then get to the meat of it, if there is any meat left on the bones, that is. Uh, and, uh, and we'll all enjoy that, because it is Halloween night. And uh, I've already put up some fun links on my blog in relationship to Halloween, a couple of follow-ups from last week and a couple of fun photos please take a look at coast to coast am.com and link up from there there are also some very ghostly images waiting for you at coast to coast am.com and speaking of ghostly images we'll start the show off before we even get to any of your calls yet with an update on a photo that we had put up before on my blog in fact i gotta remember actually i don't if i Send it through to the webmasters or not. So I'll, I'll go ahead and put that up on my blog right now, too. But a photo about a little girl uh, with a ghostly image of her grandmother overlooking her shoulder. I want to reference back to that story. It's from a few weeks ago. We'll get to that plus some ghosts of tasty Canadians on the way this hour, as well as all of your calls as we go ghost to ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. Just making a last second uh, correction to the blog at coasttocoastam.com because I got Matt Allen here. He's the late afternoon drive host, six to nine. Matt, is that what you do on WPRO AM, the Coast to Coast affiliate? That's it, Ian, absolutely. Six to nine p.m. every night, every weeknight. Okay, so am I interrupting any of your uh, happy Halloween activities? Or no, you... actually, it, it's uh, on the East Coast. It's pretty late, and uh, I just um, I'm ecstatic to be able to be here on Ghost to Ghost. This is like a, a legendary radio show that I, my my whole family, believe it or not, has listened to for many many years, and I get to be on it. So I'm kind of I'm kind of geeked out right now. <laughs> well, you know, I uh, first of all, I just want to say, you really enjoy your show. I, I caught it when I was out um, uh, on the East Coast not too long ago, and. You're such a nice guy that every time I see your picture on the website looking like you're about to kick somebody's butt, <laughs> I'm thinking, is that the same guy I met? I mean, that guy looks like he's about to fold me in half. And I remember it's like having the nicest conversation with him. So Everybody says that to me. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, maybe I'm trying to put forth an image that really doesn't accurately portray me. I, yeah. I don't know. Could it be the scowl? I don't know. Could it be the... <laughs> excuse me, you're parking in my space kind of look that you have on there. And like, um, so I, let me just say, I, I, I posted this photo and I'm going to post it up again because I meant to do it earlier. So I'm doing it right now. This, uh, this photograph of this little girl and it's on my blog. If people want to catch up to it, I think it'll be up there in a second. Um, at, uh, coast to coast am.com it's the first link i put up a couple of links but it's the first link now that i just posted this is the the image of this this little girl with her grandmother over her shoulder Mm -hmm. um that was sent to your show you were the first one to show this to me and then about a week later i posted it during uh on my blog and we talked about it during crypto news so talk about this who who sent you this photo what do you remember about 
how you got this this ghost photo before we start taking calls tonight for Ghost to Ghost. Well, what happened was this actually came in to um, one of our, our colleagues in, in the at the um, in the building where we work and um, was kind of spread around the building. And, and, this, and the story that was told to me was that this was a person, a, a young woman who lived in Rhode Island, uh, who I believe still lives in Rhode Island, and this is her niece. And I, but it, it's it's kind of I say niece, but I think it's kind of like a second cousin type of thing, you know. If you call your older cousin the uh, uncle or aunt because they're older than you type of thing. Sure. But right. it, so it's a relative, and she was by herself. I think the girl, little girl, was at the time three or four years old in the picture. Um, and I believe they were just kind of she was babysitting. It was the middle of the day and just messing around with the camera. Um, it might even be a cell phone picture, to be honest with you. I, I can't quite remember now, but it, it was a digital photo of some kind. Um, and the person, there was nobody else in the house with them. They were by themselves, and they took the picture and kind of forgot about it. Now that I'm talking about it, I do recall it being a cell phone. Right. Um, and so they took this picture. You know, she kind of just, uh, the cell phone just was, you know, closed, and that was it, forgotten about. And then later on, when the cell phone picture was downloaded to a computer, you get to see that picture and that, that, that woman's image in the upper left-hand corner there um, who, you know, according even to the, to, the, to the young lady who took the picture, she's assuming it's, a, it's an elderly relative of theirs that had passed away, a, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. But she said because, because based on the actual clothing there, but because the face is so hidden by the, uh, the little girl's hair, she can't even be 100% sure of that. Well, so, so it, and, and just for people who are just hanging on a second, just for yeah. people who are tuning in, I just double checked it, and yes, you can go catch this photograph right now. If you go to coast to coastam dot com and then click on to my blog, it'll take you to the first link is of this ghostly photo of this little girl and then this grandmotherly image that's up over her shoulder. So go ahead. This is Matt Allen of, of WPRO AM. Go ahead, Matt. And, and, you know, just the interesting things about it is that there are, you know, I'm sitting here looking at it on my iPhone, and I can blow it up on the iPhone a little bit, and, and they kind of look at it. The eyes have a very remarkable uh, resemblance between the little girl and the grandmother, and the, and the, or, the, or the, the grandmotherly figure. And the, the figure in the background, while it reflects the light source that's in the room, um, almost seems two-dimensional, like not human. It doesn't have a warmth, the human warmth to it that the little girl does. It's and, and you know we've had some people, some listeners of mine, uh, on the, when I put it up on my Facebook page, they went on there and looked at it, and and some of them uh, are, are very competent in Photoshop and whatnot, and have commented that, you know, if you if you're going to do something like this, the wispy, the little girl's wispy blonde hairs that are in front of the the uh, the old lady's face are extremely difficult to do with any sort of accuracy or any sort of you know competency. Right, because Photoshop. because they would be they would be too fine in the Photoshop, right. I would think. And I actually I was looking at this too, and there's something interesting that both her eye and then the eye of the of the grandmotherly image, and that's what this is. This is the this is the face of her grandmother behind her. That's what or, they say. They say okay. it not, I don't know, not so much her grandmother. Almost, I think it might be her great, her great grandmother's. Or her they, great mother grandmother. But yeah. it, they're, they're both of their eyes are focused on the same thing. Right. So if if it were say if it were just a digital fluke, if for some reason some you know some of these some of these pixelations existed and then they right. came together on this, I mean I don't even know how that's possible. But if it if it were just some sort of um, you know technical error or programming mistake, there's something that in the cell phone that allowed for these two images to be captured together at the same. What are the what are the odds that they would both be focused in the same way at the same place? You know what I mean? I mean, it's yeah, you're absolutely the, right. It's it, it's it, it's a very bizarre picture, and and what's interesting about it, I think, is that the the, um, the the similarity in the eye of the little girl and the eye of the old lady. Actually, I've had some listeners actually even skeptic, you know, just kind of speculate that it could actually be an older version of the little girl, kind of a future type of version of the little girl, maybe coming back to visit in some kind of time warp thing. Oh, I mean, how, some people have said that. Okay, that that that, that maybe that's that because the eyes look identical. It's it's her of the now and then her of the future. Yeah, some people have speculated that. I, okay, I, 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 that's that's interesting. But you know, that's pretty I, trippy. But it's I mean, I it's, you might I mean whatever it is, it's a cool shot and. Yeah. And it's a, and I think it's the kind of thing that you look at it and you try to come up with an explanation for how it could have been captured on a cell phone camera that way. 
Yeah, right. But you know what they say, but the, the, the clothing, that uh, the pattern of clothing, I guess, in the background is, is something that was indicative of the uh, the elderly relative, uh, okay. the great-grandmother of somebody, and, and, and she had passed away, I guess, uh, not too in the distant past um, uh, before then. And so they they kind of look at this as, I guess, a, a visit from uh, from beyond. Very interesting. Matt Allen is the, uh, is the late afternoon drive host, 6 to 9 WPRO AM in Providence, Rhode Island. They put up a photo on my blog, coasttocoastam.com. In fact, I may even have uh, uh, the webmasters go ahead and move that photo if they want to capture it from uh, from my blog and put it up on the, the main page for everybody to get a better look at it. Please go ahead. I just, at the last second, happened to put it up. And thank you, Matt, for joining us. And did you ever hear back from the family or from the people that sent that photo in? Was there ever an update from them? You know, I think they did a, a couple rounds on, on some of the radio stations that are in my building, and then that was it. I, they kind of just fell off the map, and I don't know... Um, you know, not be, for, for lack of knowledge on my on my end, I don't know what happened to them. I don't know if they uh, went forward and, and showed this to anybody else in the media. Maybe it was just kind of a weird thing for them, and they weren't really looking for, you know, anything more than a couple of minutes of fun, you know, just just showing it, showing off to the right. local media here. Because I haven't heard anything from them. I haven't seen anything. In, you know, them trying to get a reality show out of it or something. Right, like right, that. right. Yeah, so it leads you even more to the, the veracity of it because if they're not looking for anything. Right, you know, and they didn't, they, get the game? they didn't sue you or something for putting up on their website or something. So very no. good. Well, let let me know if if you do hear back from them though, because I'm sure sometime in the future somebody might want to talk to them and and uh, and see whether or not either that image of the great grandmother appeared over the little girl's shoulder again, or whether they came up with an explanation from that cell phone camera. Either one will be an interesting update. And thank you, Matt Allen, for your time tonight and getting us started on Ghost to Ghost. It's a privilege, Ian. Thank you. Good. Look forward to seeing you again when I get out that, that way again. I definitely will. And you know what? I'll do a little digging for you. And if I can get a hold of these the, the people that they originated the, the photo, I'll contact you and get your people in touch with them so you can maybe have them on as a guest as well. Great. Thanks. Say hi to Thanks, Paul Ian. for me. Okay. I will. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, co- Ghost to Ghost AM tonight. That's Matt Allen from our Coast to Coast affiliate in Providence. Well... You know, one person who wouldn't be terribly surprised by that story, if it turns out to be real, is uh, is Paul Kimball. Now, uh, Paul is a producer and a writer and a, uh, a, 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 a well, let me just ask, uh, Paul, do you, other than co-write, co-direct and co-produce, you also co-host everything you do? No, and, and hi, Ian from Canada, from a tasty Canadian. Um, <laughs> no, we, I, I, uh, the Ghost Cases series is the only one that I actually have been okay. brave enough to appear in front of the camera. I'm usually quite happy, and so are the viewers, to see <laughs> see my work okay. behind the camera. But in this, uh, but in uh, Ghost Cases, which just uh, debuted on Canadian television, you you do you are the co-host for this. Yes. Uh, okay. A friend of mine, Holly Stevens, and I co-host the series. Yeah. Uh, and so, what was your objective in in doing a, a story on Canadian ghosts? Well, it's not just it's it's not just Canadian ghosts. Eight of the episodes are uh, were filmed in Canada. Five of them we actually filmed in the United Kingdom, um, in the oh, Chester region around Manchester. So uh, it's got a bit of an international flavor. And uh, the idea was to do something a little different. I mean, there's an awful lot of ghost shows out there. Obviously, it's a popular uh, subject. But our idea was to do um, less of you know ghost hunting, as it were. And more of just two people, and they could just be any two people. They could be you or any of your listeners. It just so happens it was uh, Holly and I. Um, she has a science background. Uh, I have a history background. And we go out to these places where there are reported ghost stories or hauntings. We interview the witnesses. Um, we talk to them. We get their stories. And then we say, right, all right, let's see if we can have anything happen to us. So it's it's really uh, very much um, sort of a doc. And I come from a documentary background. It's a it's a documentary series, and it's also an experiential look at uh, the kind of thing that any of us can do if we find uh, haunted inns or haunted forts or whatever. You know, you can go in and do these sorts of things yourself. We also happen to have the typical tools of the ghost investigating trade, the EMF meters, the digital cameras, the audio recorders, and all of that. So there is the, the sort of scientific or at least pseudo-scientific side. Uh, well, but you know, at the end of the day, well, it comes down to whether we, we experience anything or not. And that's that's sort of like a producer's worst nightmare is to find out to kind of leave up 
the main action of any, any television show to variables outside of their control so that either if nothing happens, then they've got nothing to work with. So frequently on these ghost hunter shows, you can see the kind of the uh, the emphasis that the uh, the ghost hunters put on amping up the suspense for every little twig snap and and, you know, every raindrop that happens outside. And, and in effect, it ends up, I think, in a lot of cases, kind of ruining their credibility because nothing happens. They keep whipping the camera around going, what's that? What's that? But it, but it isn't anything. So what was it like for you when you would go to these places where ghostly occurrences had happened before and nothing happened? In most cases, and, and I will say there were one, uh, actually two where nothing happened. I mean, to us, one in which I'm convinced it was um, a residence of my old university, actually, uh, I was convinced when I was a student there 20 years ago, and I'm even more convinced now that it's just, you know, sort of legends that have been passed down. And so um, that just means instead of filming 13 episodes, you wind up filming 14 because obviously uh, it's, it is television. And if you get an episode like that, it, it's not going to make it to air other than in the sort of season wrap up where we revisit the best and worst evidence and, and some of the stories. And that one will make it in there where we say, look, sometimes you go to places that are supposed to be haunted. And you just find out there's a rational explanation for everything, and these, these things really are just legends. And not every house or place that's supposed to be haunted is haunted. The rest of the time, we actually, you know, that's the nice thing. It, it's not totally reliant on us. Sometimes this, when people, I'm a firm believer in the television industry, as I'm sure you know, Ian, people will often tell you talking heads are deaf. You don't want to see talking heads. But I, I'm a firm believer that when people are telling you compelling and interesting firsthand witness stories, that's good television. That's not well, good anything. I would disagree with this. I would uh, this much. I would say, talking heads are not death. They're the most fascinating things on television. If the talking heads are not actually connected to a body, <laughs> that that I don't think it gets any more interesting than if somebody were doing that. Now, so what did you what did you find? What was the best case as you, Paul Kimball? You know, co-writer, co-producer, co-host of of uh, this new series on Canadian television. What was the best evidence that you were able to come up with on your own that substantiated a previous ghost occurrence in a location? And where did it happen? Um, probably the best one was the Algonquin Hotel, which is in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, right on the border with Maine. And uh, there's a story there, real short, uh, a bride about 100 years ago who committed suicide after her uh, fiancé stood her up, didn't show up for the wedding. So she went up to room 473 and, um, and jumped out the window, you know, fell four floors, and, and she's dead. And so we were there. We were investigating it. The hotel itself is very much like the uh, hotel in The Shining. It's, it's old and creepy and big like that. And nothing much had really happened. We'd had some EMF kind of fluctuations and stuff. But we do, Holly and I do this segment uh, in every episode we call Spook Hour, where we sit in whatever room is supposed to be haunted, and we try and make contact, just the two of us. Nothing had happened there that night either, but every now and then I, I get a little feisty with the ghosts, and uh, Holly, I was so feisty with this one, um, I basically asked her out, uh, that Holly felt she had to go back. For whatever reason, we went and packed up the gear. She went back in as if she, to sort of apologize to the spirit if there was one there, and, um, and just decompress. And we had a DVR camera, a digital video camera, um, still running in the room. There was nobody else in the room. And Holly went over to look at the monitor. And the DVR camera, I'm not a big believer in orbs. I think um, until this point, almost any orb that I had ever seen uh, can be explained um, through non, non-paranormal means. But I swear, it's in the episode which airs tomorrow. Out of the wall in front of Holly, literally the shape forms and then this orb flies in a, I'll call it a light anomaly, flies in a straight line, our camera picks it up, right to the window where the, uh, the bride would have jumped out. And, and that's weird enough. And then about a second or two later, and there's no one else in the room, Holly still doesn't know to this day why she turned around. She actually turned around and looked as if, and literally following the path this orb took. And so there it is, you know, on video. We showed it to some very experienced ghost investigators in the United Kingdom. They had 30 years between them, and they said it's the most it's the weirdest piece of video they'd ever seen. Truly anomalous. They couldn't explain it. And that's the kind of thing that makes me go, hmm. That's uh, tomorrow night, then, is when that uh, that particular episode of Ghost Cases airs? Yes. Yep. Tomorrow night. Okay, so um, here's what I want to ask. Paul Kimball, I want to I put you on hold. I want you to hear some of the other stories 
that we have coming up. So I'm going to put you on hold right now. And then we'll come back to you coming up later on this hour because I want to hear then about another one of your investigations as part of your series, Ghost Cases, which just uh, debuted on Canadian television. Uh, Where we'll be able to see that particular video would be very cool if we could get a link to that for our webpage, maybe coming up for tomorrow night or next week when George Nori is on. And uh, and then also, too, I'd love to get a couple of your stories coming up next. Several people who have been on hold already. For Ghost to Ghost gets underway on Ghost to Ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. It's Ghost to Ghost AM, and uh, we'll be taking ghost stories all night long on the phones. We'll get to your first few contributions uh, coming up in just a second. We'll also get an update again from Paul Kimball from Canadian Television. Ghost Cases is his new show that's just debuting, and he's going to give us another real-life occurrence of what happened to him. If you go to... The uh, the website at coasttocoastam.com, you'll see that uh, my blog is up. I've got a couple of blogs tonight I've already posted. One was a little Halloween thing with some photos and and links. And then I, I put up that ghost photo from what I was talking about earlier this hour with Matt Allen of WPRO, which is our Coast to Coast affiliate in Providence. And it, a couple of thousand, thousand of you have already clicked on to this, uh, uh, this ghostly photo of a little girl with what appears to be her great grandmother appearing over her shoulder, uh, and and it is it is the kind of creepy ghost photo that no one's been able to quite explain. It looks simple enough, but there's no. It, it was taken on a cell phone camera. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and people that Matt had talked to who were uh, uh, experienced with photoshopping say it's really hard to do what's on the image because of the girl's wispy hair in front of the the, the face of the great-grandmother. Uh, but while you're there, too, you might want to take a look. I put up a couple other links on the blog. For example, uh, the scariest chew toy that they're selling these days. Uh, I, I bought one for my dog at my favorite pet food shop. They're selling dried esophagus. It's perfect for a vampire dog like mine. Uh, but it's a it's a it's dried esophagus. It's just disgusting. But the dogs love it. It's full of glucosamine or something, and it's supposed to be really good for them. But you can see my dog having at it there. And then also, uh, you don't want to look at this one photo. I put it up there. It's the scariest thing that can happen to a homeowner. A friend of mine who just had about uh, three inches of raw sewage back up in his basement. It's it's just you don't even want to click onto it. Don't click onto it. Or for that matter, the scariest Christmas gift in the Vermont Country Store catalog. You don't want to see that one either. You can't even, I can't, I can't believe that they put it in the catalog, but anyway. Uh, and then finally, too, I put up a link for something. This one, do click on, too. Uh, there's a great website uh, called um, myparentsweraweawesome.com. Uh, and it's uh, photos of people uploading uh, photos of their parents back when their parents were really cool looking. So... You got to take a look at it because especially in a night like Halloween, I saw people coming to the door dressed in outfits that I used to wear seriously. You know, I mean, that's kind of the weird thing about Halloween. People come to the door tonight dressed like they're in the 80s <laughs> or 70s. It's like, yeah, that, it's not a costume. That's my laundry. That's not, but, you know, kids, what can you do? So go take a look if you want to. There's some fun things and some not-so-fun things to look at at uh, coasttocoastam.com. And your calls coming up next. We'll go ghost-to-ghost with Ian Punnett. Gabrielle is in New Orleans, first-time caller line on Ghost to Ghost AM. Hi, Gabrielle. Hey, Ian. I am so pleased to be your first caller on the first caller line. You there? Yes. Is this your first call ever to Coast to Coast? It it is, but I've tried to call before. Um, I wanted to say I've got a vampire dog, too. She sleeps on the earth of her homeland. Which is where? (laughs) New Orleans. Okay, New Orleans. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, uh, this is an experience I had while I was driving along Highway 29 in North Carolina. It's a road known as the Dragon's Tail. It's a very popular road for recreational bikers uh, because there are about 300 curves within nine miles. 
I was coming into North Carolina from the north, and it was fairly late, about 10, 10 p.m. And uh, this is not a populated area. Most of this area is uh, national forest or parkland, and there aren't any houses around this uh, particular part of the uh, Dragon's Tail. So I was trying to get through this very dangerous piece of highway, and I was slowly coming around one of the curves, and I see a guy running along the highway uh, down the mountain in, in the opposite direction of where I was coming. And he wasn't exactly running. He was kind of bounding, and it looked like there was no weight hitting the pavement. He was barefoot, and he didn't have a jacket on. Now, that was strange because it was the uh, kind of the end of October, and the mountains were getting very, very cold right about then. So I drove past, and he looked at me in a very distracted way, and... When he turned his head, he turned it completely to look at me, but it didn't slow down his pace at all. I almost slowed down to ask him if he, if he needed help, but he, it, he was just too creepy that I didn't. Um, not very far ahead, about several more curves up the road, I came upon a gathering of uh, police cars with flashing blue lights, and it looked like um, there had been an accident. I had to slow down quite a bit, and as I passed, I saw that a biker had had a terrible accident and had fallen on the road. Uh, and the guy I saw just a little ways up the road looked very much like the person hmm. that was lying on the ground. Hmm. So I may have been seeing a ghost. I, I think that... that that sort of seems like that explanation which we hear from certain ghost experts who say uh, ghosts are the spirits, the confused spirits of people who can't leave this earth and that if he had had an accident and he was still processing the fact that he was dead, he would have just kept walking on up the road as though he still had a destination to meet not knowing for sure that he had been killed. Yeah. Right, and and he was running he, he he didn't have his bike anymore. Right, so right. He had to run, and he was barefoot. He didn't have a jacket on, so the coldness wasn't bothering him. It, it was just too hmm. weird. Oh, that's really interesting. I and, and and a great way to get us started. Thank you, Gabrielle. Worth getting you through for the first time on Coast to Coast. It's Zell in Washington, Maine. Zell, Zell. Uh, <laughs> welcome hey, to Ghost to Ghost. Happy Halloween. And to you. So in the mid-70s to the late 70s, I was living next door to an old wooden inn on the coast of Maine in Owl's Head that my in-laws owned. And it was wintertime. And in the wintertime, they closed up two-thirds of the inn and just lived in the, the, the heated third of the inn. And my mother-in-law was upstairs with my four-year-old nephew, Jamie. And Jamie used to play in the spare bedroom with some toys. And Jamie came out of the bedroom crying hysterically, saying, Grammy, Grammy, that man hit me. And she went in, and there was nobody there, and he was just hysterical. So she went downstairs and waited for people to come home before she'd go back upstairs. <laughs> the next day, his uncle and I were over doing laundry, and no one else was home. And we used to joke quite frequently about Fred the ghost that lived in the inn. And there'd been other odd little occurrences over the years of noises on the stairs and doors opening, the bells on the back of the door ringing. And we'd always say, oh, it's just Fred. So my husband then hollered up the stairs as we were going in through, Fred, you better not be hitting Jamie anymore. Right. And one of the doors upstairs in the bedroom slammed so hard and so loud that we just decided we were going to leave. Uh, how about that? No wind. All the doors were closed. Winter time, no windows open, no drafts, no people. Just a door going boom. Just a ghost having a tantrum. Didn't like to be told what it could do. No, not at all. 
Very interesting. Thank you, Sal. Love that story. And not uncommon, too. You know, it's funny how the door thing becomes a total cliche. You know, people, you know, doors closing, or whatever. But if you're in a house where there's no draft and something like that happens, it's fresh. <laughs> it happened to me once, too, in a house where no windows, no anything, not uneven floors, door shuts. Gets your attention. Uh, John is uh, floating somewhere in the San Francisco Bay listening to Ghost to Ghost. Go ahead, John. Happy Sam Hain, Minister Punnett. Oh, very interesting. Yes, and to you. I say happy Halloween back. But So is this something that happened to you? When you say floating in San Francisco Bay, you mean you're in some sort of boat not floating over the bay yourself right now? Right. I'm not in cement shoes or anything okay. like that. Okay. Go ahead. Um my occurrence actually happened at my old house. I was in my old bedroom at my parents' house, sleeping, sort of face down in the bed, and I felt a presence behind me very early in the morning. I sort of turned over my right shoulder to look, and I saw a sort of glowing old man just standing by the doorway. And I was sort of su- surprised, but, you know, I'd, I'd seen dozens of ghosts and things sort of breaking through reality in various ways, so... What might have paralyzed someone with terror sort of didn't really shock me very much. Um, but, but then I sort of found myself, after sort of looking him in the eyes, lying back down again on my, on my face, right in the same bed, only the presence felt closer. And this sort of discontinuity sort of jarred me a little bit, so I looked again, and the same, same old man was there. A bald old man was, was looking at me, only this time he was a couple steps closer. And as soon as I acknowledged that, boom, I was back face down in my bed again. Only this time, he felt a little bit closer. And I turned and looked, and he was there only this time a couple steps closer. And as soon as I acknowledged that, the same thing happened again. It was like I was waking up again and again in the same dream. Until finally, when I looked and turned, and it was as though I could only feel him and couldn't even feel the bed below me. But he was standing right next to me, and then he just sort of faded away. And my room sort of kind of reappeared. And that time I was really awake and just went about my day. You know, the there's a word for that. And I learned it tonight because there's a link on our webpage at uh, coasttocoastam.com about a story. Scientists are working on, um, you know, all the time trying to understand the fascination with ghosts and as it pertains to sleep paralysis. And that that experience that of which you speak ties directly into the research that they were doing on this, uh, in this story that we've linked up Uh, because they say that I think they refer to that period is hypnopompic. um, The time that you're coming out of the, out of REM sleep and that you can be caught in a, in, in a phase of sleep paralysis that you are, you feel awake, but your body is still asleep. Your mind is still asleep essentially, but you feel awake and that you are you're coming in and out of that lucidity so seamlessly that you don't realize what you're seeing is actually being generated by your own brain as opposed to an external experience that having been said i just want you to that's what they said in this article tell me why you why that would make sense to you or not make sense to you based on the experience you had it both makes sense and also doesn't make sense. To, to start off, it makes sense to me because I've had other experiences where I've been caught in a sleep paralysis sort of state okay. and have been had other mystical experiences that way in other realities, even been, you know, at, like sort of forced out of my body or forced into another realm entirely. Right. It, it doesn't make sense because in this particular instance, because later while flipping through the television stations, I found a little program called Famous Ghosts of California by the History Channel, and the ghost that I saw was one of the five most famous ghosts of California. Okay, fair enough. That's very interesting. And and your dream predated, um, you know, pre-experienced what you saw on television. Correct, Um, by years. Very good. John, thank you. That was great uh, and very interesting. And this is just how Ghost to Ghost will go all night long. I hope that Paul Kimball has been monitoring this back in the... Uh, uh, earlier in the hour, we talked to Paul, who's the co-host and co-writer and co-producer of this series that's running on Canadian television called Ghost Cases. Uh, Paul, you've uh, you've been comparing some of these stories with some of the things that you experienced. What do you hear so far? 
Well, the one about the uh, the door is interesting because, as you say, it's a bit of a cliche in in the horror film kind of thing that it, you know the door eh, it always sort of right. and closes. That actually happened to me in the episode that we aired uh, that the network story aired. I don't own a network yet. Yeah, <laughs> um, yet um, that they aired last week, which is actually up. Uh, if you go to your front page on Coast to Coast and follow the link, it goes to our blog. Oh, and, cool. Uh, and we have that episode up on uh, up on the blog, so you can watch it. And what happened uh, is, it was very odd, um, Holly was upstairs, it was a haunted farmhouse, Holly was upstairs with a psychic, and they were trying to uh, contact the spirit, and, and uh, you know, everything's game for us, we'll use anything from EF, EMF meters to psychics, you know, to, er, anything to try and see what's going on. I was downstairs in the basement, which is supposedly haunted, all by myself, and there's this back and forth and I could hear them through the, you know, through the walls. And they were saying, you know, there's a dead baby in the basement. There's a dead baby in the basement. Well, Paul's down there, <laughs> go down and say hello and show him where the baby's buried. And in fact, people have told me it's quite funny because I'm a coward and I'm in the basement going, don't, I don't want you to show me the baby. Go, don't come down here. And just as that happens, there's, there's, and I can tell you, I was there. There's no wind. There was nothing. The door, I'd been there half an hour. The, nothing had happened to the door. The door behind me as I'm sitting on the stairs of the basement goes and opens. And just as they were upstairs saying, go down and show Paul where the baby is. And I have to tell you, um, you know, there's probably about 20 things in my life over the 42 years I've been lucky enough to live that have really, truly freaked me out or scared me. And that was one of them. How um, about that? Yeah. I think that would qualify. Yeah, it, it's just, and I'm sure, you know, I'm a skeptic. I really am. I'm an agnostic on all this. And, uh, and the part of me that's a, a skeptical, logical person says, well, I'm sure there, there must be some logical explanation for that. I, I went out. I thought the crew was playing a practical joke on me, frankly. Right. And right. Uh, the thing about the farmhouse door was it wedged in to close the basement door. Um, you know, it, it was hard to open. Uh, so even if there had been a breeze, it would have had to be a pretty stiff one. And there was nothing. Um, I had heard the breezes earlier in that evening. It was still as, as the grave, as they say, outside. And that one really freaked me out, especially given the timing of what was going on upstairs at the same time as I'm downstairs and the, then this happened. So that, that story that I heard about, you know, any time I hear about right. four is opening, that resonates with me now. Um, again, you can link up to that episode then at uh, coasttocoastam.com to Ghost Cases. This was the episode for the new Canadian television series that just uh, aired last week. Um, it, is it, Paul Kimball is the co-host of the show and the co-investigator of these uh, ghost stories. Is there a difference between, say, uh, Canadian ghosts and, um, you know, ghosts from the United States? Are they, are American ghosts the same as Canadian ghosts? Canadian ghosts, are they more sarcastic than, than American ghosts? Is there anything you seen in the, or any difference in the in the in the character of the stories at all? I think more Canadian ghosts probably speak French. Um, <laughs> but other than that, no. I mean, ghost stories. Uh, the the group, people ask me, they say, because I've done a number of documentaries about UFOs and stuff, and uh, people say, well, what what are ghost story, what are ghost investigating like compared to UFO stories? And I go, it's all about the search of for us trying to find um, something with UFOs. It's like, is there life out there, perhaps? But ghosts, ghosts are the most existential of the whole lot because it says to us, is there life for us personally beyond what we have right here? And the stories that you hear across the world when we were in the United Kingdom or the United States right. or in Canada, the, there are, there's a stunning similarity between um, them. And, uh, and I don't think there's any real difference. Obviously, if you're in a place in Alabama and you're in Ontario or you're in right. Scotland, there's, there's regional differences. But the, the crux of the stories remain the same. And there's certain characteristics that you can break down and say, okay, this is what's happening here. And, and it, as you said in, I think, an earlier segment, I heard you say it um, with one of your callers, it, it often seems tied to some traumatic event. So um, that seems to be a common theme, too. Yeah. Well, good. Well, we'll be following that. And uh, I hope that when we can see that episode about the orb, because we won't be getting ghost cases down here in the United States, um, at least for a while. Will you let it, will you put up a link on that page too and let us know so that we can let people see that? Because that would be really cool. I will indeed. After it airs tomorrow and the network uh, doesn't get mad at me for putting it up, I will make sure that that's okay, good. up there and everybody can see it at our at our blog. Oh, very good. And then we, I gotta, I'll gotta, i send a note to the webmasters and make sure that they put that up so that people can see it on our webpage. Thank you so much. Paul, enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for getting us started. And, and everybody else, hang on. The phones are filling up for Ghost to Ghost.
your ghost stories for the rest of this night all across North America and beyond. What life is out there? What life exists in here somewhere deeply buried in a soul that doesn't want to let go of this earth on Ghost to Ghost. This is Ian Punnett. Well, I went link crazy on the blogs tonight. I put up two of them. So if you want to link up there at coast to coast am.com. Other great stories, including that story that I mentioned in one of the previous callers about sleep paralysis as it helps explains uh, uh, as it helps to explain ghost stories, except that what we've already heard are the number of occurrences that happen with people who are fully wide awake, not anywhere near uh, either going into or coming out of a dream state. So that's what, you know, an expert is saying to try to dismiss the story which you experienced. So let's just put that in a little box over there to say, okay, maybe maybe for a percentage of ghostly experiences, there is some sort of scientific explanation. But what happened to you? We'll find out next on Ghost to Ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. Let's get back started going ghost to ghost with Dean on a wild card line in Tampa. Go ahead, Dean. Yes, sir. Uh, Good evening, sir. How are you doing tonight? Happy Halloween, Dean. Happy Halloween, sir. In fact, I'm getting chills as I'm on hold thinking about uh, the story back in the summer of 85. We're doing doing something right if your own story is scaring you. So we're off to a good start. In fact, it's uh, it's very surreal, sir. In fact, as I'm thinking about it, on, on the whole part of it, I'm definitely experiencing some uh, interesting emotions. But um, getting to, to the point of the story, uh, sir, I just moved down to Grapevine, Texas. I had just gotten my driver's license. And a friend of mine who had moved from Alaska was in Fort Worth, so I decided to take a little road trip one, uh, one Saturday evening. And my mom had gotten out of town, so I, I was able to borrow her brand-new car since I had not driven long enough to get my own car. So I'm in my mom's car. I drive to Fort Worth. I'm at, I'm at this friend of mine's house, and this party next door spills over. So being neighborly, we all decided to kind of you know partake in what they were doing. And and from from just I missed talking to people, I suddenly came upon a lady by the name of Clarity, and uh, I found her very fascinating. And and it was just that the one thing I noticed though is I we had just gotten to the party, and she was very insistent on leaving. And I just met her. She seemed like a really great girl. And yet, you know, it's like one of those fleeting moments where you're thinking, you just had the door open, but yet now she's closing the door. And then she tells me she'd been abandoned by her friends and she needed a ride home. So, well, Mama raised me right, so I decided to be chivalrous. And, you know, and at this point, I'm 18. I'd never been with a woman in my life. So I'm thinking, any girl that's willing to get in my car, I'm willing to drive you to China if you need me. So I said, no problem. She goes, well, I live in Denton, Texas, which is just north of, um, of Grapevine. So we're on the highway, sir, and I'm, I've just, you know, I've just been driving for a few weeks now, and I'm really not sure where I'm going, but I'm following her direction. And, and sir, the most amazing thing happened. I, I realized that all the city lights of the Fort Worth and the Metroplex had dissipated as our conversation had become very engrossing. Uh, the greatest hits of the Eagles are playing on the uh, tape deck, and as the "Long Way Home" song is playing. I suddenly realized that I'm not seeing street, I'm not seeing signs for anything relating to Dallas and Fort Worth, and there is no turnoffs, there is no nothing, and it was so surreal because it felt like one of those kind of Quentin Tarantino movies where it's like kind of smoke going by. You, there's no exits, there's no nothing. You're just trapped in this. It's like a lost highway. And and I remember at one point I'm getting really nervous because I'm thinking I have no idea where I'm going, and suddenly I see a sign that says Oklahoma, 35 miles, and I'm going that can't be good. So she goes, oh, hold on. She goes, take a right. So I'm thinking, oh, thank God Almighty, she knows where she's going. So we're suddenly in Denton, Texas. I'm happy. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm awake. I'm good. I'm ready to drop her off. She goes, well, let's just make one stop. I'm like, okay. At this point, I'm still pretty gullible. So she, we go to an apartment complex, and there's a hill right by the parking lot. And she goes, well, we just need to go over the hill, and I want to show you something. And she's very, if, uh, Ian, is, she, he's, she's very persistent. It's just all about, I felt like she was, she felt like she was on a mission. Okay. So I decided to go with her. So I, we go over this hill, and I, I suddenly come, come upon this stone gate, and a huge, huge stone gate, but there was a part of it that had been knocked down, and it looked like something something very big had hit it. So I just kind of took note of that, and as we w- walked through, it, it's a uh, July um, summer evening, still, extremely still. I mean, there's no wind, no nothing. I mean, you could literally hear, you know, silence has a sound. 
and that was the sound I was hearing. And I'm following her through this graveyard, and I'm, I'm not one of those people, sir, that, you know, like, hey, let's go to the graveyard to have a good time. But um, at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to try anything you know, for the first time. So uh, she takes me into the graveyard, and we're looking around, and, and I'm stopping. I'm kind of looking around, and I notice there's a full moon out. And the moon is so bright, it's, just, it's almost hypnotic. And I'm looking at this moon, sir, and from out of nowhere, seven white birds just suddenly, I mean, it was almost like they kind of like collectively formed a, a little flying bee. But what was so amazing was it was so quiet, I could actually hear their wings rustle, but it wasn't in a flittering moment. It was almost in like a harmonic moment, like they're all in, in such unity. And I'm sitting there going, I'm looking at the full moon, I'm looking at these <clears throat> seven brilliantly white birds. In, in the in the darkest of dark of nights in Texas, and I'm thinking this is really amazing, right? And somebody from behind me, I hear her quoting some type of prophecy about the seven white birds and about the returning of the the girl, the angel home. And I'm getting like this chill, like you and Belize. I'm looking at the moon, I'm looking at the birds, and she's doing this prophecy thing behind me, and it's all coming together. And at the moment, she says, "Come home." I, I I just turned around and all I see is this whiff of smoke, almost like that look of like you because I live in Alaska and I remember you know when it's cold you can see your breath. It was like that, sir, but it was 80 degrees and it was like it was almost cold as it hits my cheek and I'm standing there in the middle of the graveyard in Denton, Texas, and she's gone. And I have, except for a whiff of smoke, so I'm screaming the name. I'm screaming for clarity in a graveyard in Texas in the middle of the night, trying to figure out what's going on. So I after about a half an hour of looking around. I, there's a gas station right down the street. So I decided to amble my way down there, get some gas for the road trip home. And I'm, I must have looked shooken up because <laughs> the guy goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I just, you won't believe what just happened. And I tell him the story. And he looks at me, he goes, he goes, uh, son, he goes, you're the third one that's happened to me. He goes, I've, I've been working the night shift now for seven years. I says, let me tell you a little story about clarity. And I'm like, I literally, my knees just, in fact, my knees are wobbling as I speak about this. He, 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 he starts to tell about this, um, it was a prom that I guess back in sometime in the seventies, but a group of teenagers were driving in this apartment complex had hit the hill, gone over the hill. And with this big old, like this pickup truck had hit that stone gate that I noticed that had been knocked down and wound up killing everyone in the, in the truck, including the driver, a young lady who was graduating the night at the prom named Clarity. Turns out, he's like going, well, you're, you're not the first one that's returned Clarity home. So at this point, I'm thinking, I'm, you know, so, but here's the part where Coast to Coast comes in hand. Uh, one ghostly night, I call into Art Bell, and I tell him the ghost story of Clarity. And, sir, I'm standing in Grapevine, Texas, and it's another still Texas night. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's 2 a.m. I'm telling Clarity. I'm telling about Clarity to Art. And I hang it at the moment I tell the story, and I say, go home. You guys clicked off. There was a burst of lightning that hits a transformer right across the street. In the in the burst of lightning, sir, the moment your phone clipped off, that lightning hits the transformer, lights up my room brilliantly. I turn around and I see five people standing in my room, and I'm, I'm alone. So I'm like, and, and it was the most amazing thing was it was like five women of all various ages. It looked like a family, but it was like it was like there was it, it wasn't our time period. It was like sometimes like a hundred years ago. Okay. They were, standing, they were standing there, very calm, and, and the lightning, the light of the transformer is is just for a moment. I see them clear as day, and the sir, I wasn't frightened, I wasn't scared. It was like acceptance because I'd seen them before. Just a week before that, I'd nearly gotten into a catastrophic accident as I'm driving the highways of uh, Dallas Fort Worth, and I remember these people running around my car, making sure my car was safe, and those very same people showed up that night when I hung up the phone with Coast to Coast, so you never know what can happen when you call Coast to Coast. Very good. Well, then, and I'll be curious to see what happens and as this uh, multi-chaptered story of yours continues this time next year, then. And we'll hear the update of what happened when you told the update of what happened on Ghost to Ghost AM. Judy is in Texas on Coast to Coast. Judy? Yes. Happy, happy Halloween. Halloween. And to you, too. I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible. I know there are a lot of people excited to share their experiences. Yes, there are. I happen to uh, have a construction company, and a lot of the houses that we work on are where uh, people have passed away. Right. And uh, watching these programs where um, you have the ghost hunters saying, okay, well, show us that uh, you're here and 
make these noises or, you know, knock something around, you know, that uh, uh, that's only half of the job of why these forces or why these uh, spirits are showing themselves. They're asking for help to go to the other side, much like you hear the EVPs saying, help me. You know, they do. That's what they want is some help. They need some guidance. Maybe they need, excuse the pun, maybe some clarity. But uh, uh, I, along with my construction crews, um, knowing that we run into, you know, shadows and uh, actually we can feel the actual room or, you know, where somebody has passed away, we, we know how to uh, get together to help the uh, the spirits go to the other side. So I think there's a lot more, uh, you know, uh, you know, as far as be really being able to help people uh, get closure to be able to go to the light so they can be with, uh, you know, with their loved ones. And uh, uh, the last uh, situation, the man had uh, passed away uh, in, a, in a room. He was dead, uh, I guess, three days before anybody even found him. And there was... Uh, you know, a moisture imprint of his body in the uh, wooden floor. And um, we could see his uh, his uh, shadow going uh, around the house like he was looking at what we were doing to, hmm. to make sure that uh, we were uh, working on his house to make it nice. He apparently was a painter. So we hmm. went ahead and, uh, you know, told him, you know, more than welcome anytime, you know, and uh, when things started uh, started to uh, get a little bit bizarre where uh, we realized that he was asking for help uh, then we you know actually had uh, helped him uh, go to the other side we as a, how did you fact, do that how did you do that we uh, all held hands around the um, around the uh, where spot the, in the floor it, yes at the portal and uh, where the person had passed and uh, we all got together. We had to do it in Spanish because this gentleman, you know, was uh, Hispanic. And uh, we had actually seen him manifest um, outside the window mm. like he was looking in. He, and he really looked solid. It was just amazing. And mm. uh, we all got together and, and told him that he uh, had all of his relatives on the other side waiting for him and that uh, he was a good person. And he didn't have to worry about the house, that it was going to be a beautiful house and that it was time for him to move on to be with his, his people. And mm. it was almost like, um, I, you know, you, you know how the, um, uh, it feels like you could cut the air with the knife, uh, you know, right. when you have tension. It was just like all of a sudden this uh, wind seemed to just gust through the, the house and you could tell that uh, it was, it, was, it felt so positive, you know, right after, you know, we had uh, prayed for him. So, you know, it, hmm. I really appreciate being able to share that with people. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, and I hope that uh, Paul will keep that in mind, you know, when he's doing his show, that there are spiritualists that will help uh, actually finish the job instead of just, you know, leaving in the middle of when the EVPs are saying, help me, you know, I mean. It, well, you know, and, and thank you, Judy. I appreciate that. And I, I think that there's something interesting too, Joe, about people who are going into a, a ghost experience, like Paul Kimball, she's referring to from Canadian television, who's just who are just trying to see whether they can replicate the experience, or or rather have a similar experience happen to them. And I think that uh, sometimes with the ghost adventurer types that go into these uh, uh, hauntings. I think that maybe sometimes they're trying to do too much or or maybe it gets confused as to exactly what it is they're doing. I think your point's a real good one. Uh, but uh, I do think it's cool that, that Paul just went in with just kind of an open mind to see whether or not they could see the same things that other people have seen. That in itself is kind of science, right? Is whether or not you can have the same experience repeated. Uh, and uh, and then maybe after that, then you send in the people who will help these spirits move along. Scott is in Cape Cod on on Ghost Hello. to Ghost. Scott. Hello, Ian. Hey. Nice to talk to you. Um, you. About 13 or 14 years ago, my friend and I used to uh, go around the western New York State area checking out different paranormal sites for ourselves. Right. We were both what you would call 
I guess, skeptics. And we, we basically never, we never encountered anything at any of these sites, but um, we heard of the, there's a Holiday Inn in Grand Allen, New York, and it's the Haunted Room, room 422. So I called up there requesting that room. At first, they wouldn't give it to me. Um, but we kind of made up a fib. I hope they're not listening to this now, but we made up a little fib that we were starting a Haunted Getaways magazine. <laughs> so they totally changed their tune. They're like, sure, you can, we'll reserve that room for you. I'm pretty so, sure the uh, uh, I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations on fake magazines has run out, so you're okay. So don't worry. <laughs> Thank God. Um, but yeah, so we went there. We were pretty much just in the room the whole time. Nothing happened, and uh, my buddy went down pretty early. He was pretty tired, and I had uh, just watching TV, and I started to get this horrible, horrible almost like a tightening feeling in my chest and started to get really cold in the room. And there was no, you know, the fan, no air conditioning was on at the time. And I just couldn't believe what was happening. I was like, oh, my God. And I'm, I'm looking around, and it just it felt like the room was closing in on me. And I'm not agoraphobic or, you know, right. or claustrophobic, anything like that. And just got progressively colder and colder. And really started to freak me out. I woke my friend up, and he, you know, I thought he was joking around with him at first, and he started to feel the same thing. So we never really, you know, we never saw any ghostly visages or anything, but um, right. it freaked both of us out to the point where we kind of gave up for a while on that. So I don't know. Well, I was, freak, you out, freak, that. freak you out enough to that you might actually want to start a real magazine about ghost stories. You might have thought about that. But, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, um, very interesting. Well, you know what? I, I, I spoke with somebody earlier in the week who had a similar experience. She told me that uh, she was visiting a friend's house and that uh, this friend had warned her that there's a ghost in the house. And she had kind of laughed it off. She was uh, 16, and her girlfriend lived in the basement. And she was down there, kind of a sleepover. The next morning, her friend had even said to her, again, you know, hey, keep an eye out. There's a, there's a mischievous ghost around here. Uh, and that the uh, ghost was of a 16-year-old boy who had died in the house, um, that he was not a mean-spirited ghost, but they had this f- presence, this sense of him all the time around. And so the woman who told me the story said that she's not particularly a believer in ghosts, although she said this happened to her, and she's been really trying to process it ever since, is that her friend had called down, I guess it was time for breakfast or something, and and she was she was left alone in the basement. And she was fixing her hair, makeup in the mirror. And uh, so she was concentrating on her own face as she looked in the mirror. And suddenly the distinct feeling, not a small feeling, but the distinct feeling of somebody tugging on the back of her hair so hard that it yanked her head back. So she's looking in the mirror. She sees her. She both sees and feels her head go jerked back. And she turned around and there was nobody there. Uh, and she shot up those basement stairs. Um, so, yes, sometimes those presences stay with us. And I hope that you stay with us, too. Lots of people on hold with their ghost-to-ghost stories. I know that uh, as I look down the list here, we're representing not just all over the United States, but also up in Canada as well. If you missed the first hour, go back and catch it in Streamlink. It's worth it. And uh, if you don't get through tonight, of course, you know, there are many of opportunities in the future. Uh, we'll try to get an open line for you. But if not, you know, we'll have other ghost guests coming up. I had to be careful on ghost guests coming up who will be talking about these stories, too. So good luck tonight and just keep listening to Ghost to Ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. And we're going ghost to ghost for all of your stories. We'll get an open line for you coming up next on Ghost to Ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. 
Let's pick it up with Ethan in Minneapolis. First time caller line on Ghost to Ghost. Ethan? Uh, me? That, are you Ethan? Yeah, that's me. I'm Ethan. <laughs> Say, I had, um, I've had a lot of weird experiences for way back from 18. I was 18, 25 or whatever years ago, all the way from, uh, uh, paranormal experiences to extremely close encounter of a UFO. Anyways, um, a few years ago, I'm in a house that I owned and, um, I have all the lights are off. The curtains in the front picture window aren't aren't on, so the window's just bare glass. And uh I I live in Minneapolis, you know, so I keep the door locked all the time. And I'm walking to the door, I open the door, I walk in. Hey, I didn't shut the door behind me, which is unusual, and I just uh, went straight in the house toward the refrigerator. And my son's roommate uh, was laying on the couch, and his eyes are adjusted, you know, to the lights and everything there uh, from the street light outside. And he jumps up and uh, heads, heads toward me real quick and flips on the light. And at that time, I turned around when the light flipped on, it was like right by the refrigerator, and he had his shock in his face. I mean, you could just see it. All, all, his face was just like shock. And, and then uh, he said that the, a girl followed me in, uh, about five foot five, uh, blonde hair, dimples on her cheeks, and uh, a red blazer. And she sat at that chair, and he pointed at the chair, and as soon as I put the light on, she disappeared. But the weird thing is, is I've always had um, weird things happen in my life. But a couple of weeks prior to this, I always get these cold drafts in the house. And all of a sudden, I smell perfume. Hmm. It's just me and my son and another another guy living there, and and I'd uh, get these uh, cold drafts and I smell perfume. There's no woman in the house, <laughs> hmm. and uh, so I thought that was pretty hmm. weird. Isn't it? And yeah, then, really, yeah. Very good. Very interesting. Very and and did you ever find out about the the blonde girl with the dimples? Well, no, but the uh, I never found out about that. I my the the roommate I had was so uh, uh, uptight about it. He started packing a couple of days later and moved out. He says I can't live in this house no more. He said. Mm. <laughs> so, very interesting. Very interesting. I appreciate that. Great stories and and keep them coming. Let's get back to west of the Rockies where Rob is in Washington on Coast to Coast. Rob? Hey, Ian. Hey. Hey. Happy happy Halloween. Yeah, happy Halloween to you, too. <laughs> well, um, I grew up um, in, a, in a town called Bellevue, Washington, not too far from Issaquah, where I live now. And Bellevue's just a little outside of Seattle, uh, Seattle, Washington. And uh, years ago, back in the late 70s, um, early 80s, I was kind of in elementary school around the time. I remember... Um, my uncle, um, who was probably about 18 at the time, he lived with my mom and dad, and he came uh, just crashing through the door one time uh, at night. And uh, when he was pounding on the door, he was just screaming for my mom to open up the door. My mom comes over, she opens up the door, and he comes in, and, the, and he was just white as a ghost. And um, I'll never forget that. Um, it was just actually it was just my wife, my, my, my mom, me, and my sister at home at the time. And uh, he comes in, he's just like, Diane, which is my mom's name. And he's just like, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. And he, and he comes inside and he sits down and he starts relaying this story um, about what happened to him. And just to kind of give you a background of my uncle, he's not the kind of guy that makes up a story that would ever make him look like a wimp or, or right. scared in any sort of way. I mean, he was just kind of like an all-American athlete. And, in fact, that night that this occurred, he had just gotten back from a, a wrestling meet and, I mean, he was like a state champion wrestler, football player, everything. And uh, just not too much scares this guy. And uh, what had happened was we lived along a long stretch of road in Bellevue called 148th. And there used to be this big gap where there was no street lights on this one lake, which is called Blueberry Lake. The lake was surrounded by blueberry bushes. And then in, in the spring and summer, people would pick them. And that's why it's called Blueberry Lake. Got it. Um, yeah. And Good. so he got... He got dropped off um, after a wrestling match 
um, sometime, somewhere on the other side of that lake. And as he was walking home along 148th, he, he started walking through the area of the lake where it was really dark. Uh, there was no street lights. And the, the next street light was, you're looking at like 200 yards down, like about a good foot, two football fields. And um, as he's walking, he just kind of walked at a normal pace. Um, he says he begins to, um, you know, feel or uh, hear something pushing through the bushes just to the left of him, our, our blueberry bushes. Now, the blueberry bushes are about six feet high, um, and they're cropped off, and something was just pushing through the bushes, and it was it was kind of pacing him, as he, as he recalled. Um, and, he, and he would stop, and he would look to his left and see what it was, and it, and it would stop. And then he would begin wa- proceed walking again, and then it would mm-hmm. proceed walking. Um, and right away, he knew, obviously, whatever this was, was could see him, and it was intelligent enough to stop when he was stopping. And he wasn't quite too sure, you know, what it was. So he kind of picked up his pace, and mm-hmm. sure enough, he could hear this thing picking up its pace as well, just kind of pushing through the blueberry bushes. And um, eventually, um, he picks his pace up a little bit more, and it, it can't push through the blueberry bushes any as, as fast as he's walking by this time. So... He hears it behind him exit the bushes and come onto the sidewalk where he is. And, he, he, and as he says, he says it sounded just like a, a, a human's bare foot falls on, on, on cement. It was just like a slapping sound, like your, your, your bare feet would sound on cement. And right. he could hear it like slapping, and it was just kind of like at a, at a fast walk. And so he kind of picks up into a jog, and then this thing picks up into a jog. And... Uh, he doesn't really know what to do at this time. His heart's pounding, so then he just just blitzes as far as fast as he can, and he could run back then. I mean, he was an athlete. Sure. And this thing this thing starts taking off after him as fast as he could, but because my uncle was so fast, I mean, he began to pull away from this thing. He could hear him. He could hear this thing getting further and further behind him. Um, and then suddenly he he heard it kind of skip and then skip. And then, as he says, he heard these huge thunderous wings just slapping the air. Just, just like slapping, and, he, mm. and then he, and then immediately he no longer heard footfalls. This thing had come off the ground, and he can actually hear not only the reverberation of the the uh, the, the wing beats. I mean, he can actually hear it or feel it on his hair and on mm. on, on on his on his jacket from behind him. It was th- it was thumping so hard, mm. and then it was it, as it began to fly. Obviously, it picked up speed and it, st- it stayed with him. And uh, he he was just running as hard as he could to the nearest light, which was a you know like I said a good 200 yards away. And he says, as it just began to get over above him, um, he says he he got into the light the, of the first street light, and he says this thing screamed and then it shot straight up and like he didn't like the light, it would kind of avoided the light. And then each street light was about oh they're but they're about 50 50 yards apart, about 50 yards apart I would say, and so. He kept running in between in between the uh, street light. He would dive bomb him in between street lights, and then would it would go back up out of the light. It just would not like the light. And uh, our apartments wasn't too far beyond that, um, about a good a good another hundred hundred fifty yards. And but it was all uphill. <laughs> he had to run uphill. Hmm. And as as he made the turn into our apartment buildings, um, there was a bunch of trees, a lot of pine trees right there, and it, it cut the corner. And he could hear it crash into the into the trees, and and he just heard big thick branches snapping, and and he heard it scream, just kind of, and then and then we were just one. We were just the second apartment building in, and then we were on the second floor. And then he just came huffing up that floor and about tore the the door down, pounding it, just screaming for my mom. Well, as um, the as, as the as this winged creature was coming in between the the lamp posts, did he get any sort of look at what it was while you said it was dive bombing him? No, that that's the whole that's the whole thing about it. It's like you know, that's the kind of mystery about it. it was he never? I mean, I, you know, and it's I guess it's easy for us to look back and. In, in, in Monday morning quarterback that after, but you know, I mean, I guess if I was in his shoes and like he said, he goes, all I could think about was just, was just running. I didn't, I didn't have time to like turn my head. I was just, he was just running for his life and it absolutely felt threatened by yeah. whatever this thing was. And so, um, and, um, and is it, had anybody else reported this in the blueberry Lake area? I mean, is this, yeah, is, yeah, absolutely. Other the, people. 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's that's the that's the that's the strange part about this was around this time, um, in around this time, there was a lot of um, little kids that gone missing uh, in the in the Bellevue area. And I'll, I'll never forget the Bellevue Police Department used to come to our school almost weekly almost weekly and talk to us kids about just not stopping anywhere, going straight home after school. Don't cut through the woods. Don't talk to strangers. A lot of kids began disappearing. There was also a lot of dogs and cats disappearing. Um, just a lot of strange things happening around that time. It was really bizarre. Um, and, and, and what's, what's funny is, um, there's, uh, years later, I'm talking 15, 20 years later, I, um, I ran into some really good friends of mine who used to live in Bellevue, and and I I rarely tell this story, um, and I actually, for whatever reason, I told that story to them, and they were like, "You got to be kidding, Rob!" They go, "I got a story for you," and I was like, "Okay," and so they started telling me they actually live um, near uh, Sammamish High School, which is not too far. It's only actually about a block from Blueberry Lake. They live near there, and um, Nancy and Daryl, it's 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 a, it's a son and and mother, um, and the son was telling me the story about he and his mom used to walk around the track, not too far from Blueberry Lake. He used to walk around the track at Sammamish High School, and he said he used to kick his uh, kick his uh, soccer ball around his ball. His mom would walk and exercise. He says one time he goes, Rob, he goes, I, I kicked the soccer ball, and it went off off the track into these ro- large rhododendron bushes. In fact, those rhododendron bushes are still there. Um, um, and he says, he goes, I go down there to retrieve my ball. The ball had rolled underneath the rhododendron. This is broad daylight, Ian, broad daylight. Um, but these rhododendrons, I know what he's talking about. These are extremely thick, thick bushes. Right. And so he goes down to, to retrieve his ball, and he kind of squats down. He could see his ball way down in about four or five feet, tries to reach in. And then he grabs the ball and pulls it out. And then he notices what he thinks at the time is the dog. And he's thinking, Oh, what's this dog doing in here? It's all kind of cowered up and, you know, and, and, and keep in mind, he's, he's barely seeing this, but he thinks it's a dog. And, and, um, he, he goes, Hey, ba- hey, hey boy. And he starts kind of whistling, like, come here, come here. And he's trying to get it to move and it's not moving. He's thinking that's strange. What's this dog doing? And so, uh, my, my buddy Daryl, uh, reached his arm inside the rhododendron bush all the way up to his neck. And he says, he, he goes, I touched it's fur. And he goes, and it was like, he goes, it was like wet fur, like wet fur. And he goes, when my finger penetrated through the hair, he goes, I could feel the warmth of its body beneath it. And he goes, he goes right at that moment. He goes, I saw it was not a dog. He's, it was like a human, humanoid looking face. And it was covered in like a dark gray hair. The face was gray. He said he could see a nose, everything. And And then right when he poked it, uh, he had ended up poking it right in the shoulder. He said the eyes opened and the eyes were just red. And then he said it kind of like smiled like a grimace, but not 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 a smile, but I guess more of a grimace, um, kind of grimaced at him. And then he just like jumped up, screamed for his mom, and then took off running. And, and man, I was just, I mean, that was a pretty freaky story. And all that yeah. happened around the same time, and it was just kind of neat how we kind of ran into each other and I right. just happened to tell him my story and then he relayed my story and I was just like wow there was something really really strange around that time well I appreciate that Rob in fact it's interesting is that they they may or may not be connected stories you know and kind of what he describes there sounds a little bit more like sort of the classic dogman stories like we've been hearing about mostly from the upper midwest yours sound like something a little bit different uh, that which happened to your uncle um, sound a little bit more like the sort of the Thunderbird stories, right? Or the, the, the sort of giant ancient predators, which many people maintain these raptors are still with us. Or maybe it is some sort of uh, other thing falling into the category of, you know, D, all of the above, shapeshifter, whatever. But that's what Ghost to Ghost is all about. And that's why Vicky's hanging on too with her story from Midland, Texas. Vicky? Vicky, yep, she's gone. I'm just getting to you, Vicky, and I'm sorry. It looks like you hung up just as we got there. Uh, call back if you can. Tim is in San Diego. Tim, can we get you in before the top of the hour? Sure. Happy Halloween, and uh, happy Halloween to my dad, Jack, in Wyoming. Dayton, That's Wyoming. good. Happy Halloween, Dad. All right. Well, uh, let's see. I uh, I was given three months to live. I had diffuse cystic lymphoma, a rare kind of cancer. And uh, all the people with my type had died. And uh, 
when I had gotten it, and I think they'd seen 13 cases. So they pretty much didn't even know how to treat it. But they were going to give me my first treatment in Portland, Oregon. And uh, my mom couldn't come with me, so my aunt drove me up there to get some more biopsy work done. And uh, during the operation, I had died. And uh, I remember seeing, like, kind of going to lights and stuff and, and then sort of flashing through some of my past. And then all of a sudden, I remember kind of seeing my house and my room and stuff and then my mom. And then uh, it kind of cut out and, and I didn't really think much of it. And then uh, my mom had been going to college, and she was in her finals, doing finals and stuff, so she couldn't come with me and take me to uh, get my biopsy stuff, so my aunt took me. And uh, she came home from school, and her boyfriend at the time, he went into the restroom downstairs, and so she needed to go, so she went upstairs, and uh, and she says that uh, she had this letter, and she was reading it, and it was from my brother Brad. And she's reading the letter, and and uh, she said she sees me. Well, here, well, here's exactly what happened. I, I get home from the hospital, and uh, I go to the front door and open it up, and I see my mom, and I say, and for some reason I'm like, Mom, did I get a letter from Brad? And she says, yeah, and she's looking like kind of weird. And so she goes and gets it, and I read it, and it's pretty touchy and stuff. So the next day... She takes me to my uh, nutritionist, and that's how I actually beat the cancer. I didn't do the traditional uh, radiation and chemo. I did it through nutrition. I'm glad it, prayer, whatever whatever prayer, worked for you, I'm glad it worked for you. Yeah, and prayer, you know, I, I talked to God and stuff and prayed, and, and so, but the, the nutrition really helped too. So anyway, so she brings me to my nutritionist, and then I guess she told her, that I, you know, a story and, and that, that some stuff, weird stuff had been happening with me and everything. So they wanted me to draw pictures of what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing. I'm like, you guys are kooks. And, uh, so then we're on our way home and she, and it's like kind of storming and stuff. And she pulls over and she says, Timmy, I got to tell you, uh, I'm really freaked out. And she's all, you're like powerful or something. So, but on the way, on the way to our appointment, though, I see this car and uh, it looks like it's going to crash right into us. We're driving on the freeway and I see this ranchero. Uh, I look over, I'm looking at my mom and I kind of see it out of the corner of my eye. It comes right around like in the fast lane and we're like in the number two lane and it cuts right in front of us and then goes off and just hits like an embankment, but it didn't look like a gnarly crash, but it almost took us out. So I, I told her, wow, that was crazy. And she says, what are you talking about? I said, that car crash. And she, and she says, well, I didn't see what you're talking about. And uh, does that mean that we're, we got to go? Uh, it means I, I, we want to hear the end of the story. Okay, so, so, here, so, then, uh, so then my mom says, she pulls over and she says, Timmy, when you were in the hospital, you died. And, uh, or did you, what, you know, what happened? She goes, I, when I came home, I saw, uh, I went upstairs, I was reading the letter and then you came and you talked to me and I told you to go out and close the door and I'll come back and, and I'll talk to you in a little bit when I'm done reading the letter from my brother, Brad. So then, uh, she, and. What I saw the park Hang on, Tim. I'm going to ask you to. I, I I wanted to get the whole story in before the top of the hour, but it sounds like you're going to need to organize that ending a little bit, and we'll come back for it, and we'll ask everybody to keep those stories focused too, so we can get everybody in tonight on Ghost to Ghost. This is Ian Punnett. Well, we're going to grab Tim. We just had him on before the top of the hour, and then the music was running, and I think Tim was just getting up to the climactic kind of revelation of the story of Ghost to Ghost AM tonight. So, Tim, in San Diego, so if I were to give a headline to the story, the headline is, 
your mother saw your ghost, saw you as a ghost when you died on the operating table. Exactly. Okay. And so what happened was, uh, right when I get back from all of it, like a, a week later, I get back and and um, she, we, she's taking me to my do- my nutritionist appointment, and I see this car crash, and then she uh, she looks over and says, "What are you talking about?" Because I told her, "Wow, did you see that crash?" And then she's like, "What are you talking about?" And, and then like five seconds later, it was like a delay, and then it happened, and uh, we just avoided getting in that crash. So then we hmm. went to the doctor's appointment, and she's telling the new, them a the nutritionist about what happened. So she's trying to make me draw pictures and I think these people are crazy. And, uh, so then we're on my way home from my appointment and it's late, late, you know, later in the evening and it's storming and stuff. My mom pulls over on the freeway and she says, I'm really scared. I'm freaked out about what things that's happened lately. And she says, when you were in the hospital, I uh, came home from, from school and I went to the restroom upstairs because Tim was in the other bathroom. And, uh, and then uh, she says that she was reading a letter from my brother, and I and I can't. I told her, "Mom, Mom, I don't feel very good." And so she looked looked at me and said, "I looked really pale and stuff." And she says, "Well, honey, go close the door and give me my space. She, I'll come back and I'll talk to you in a little bit." So right. When she was done, she went out there and looked for me and thought, "Oh my God, he's in the hospital." So then he she ran downstairs and her her boyfriend at the time was still in the bathroom. And so when he came out and she got a hold and she says, something terrible has happened to Timmy. We got to go to the, uh, we got to find out what's going on. So she calls my uncle. Okay. And, and I, I got to, I got to get to the story. And he's got to come somewhere here too, because you got so many people waiting. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. She calls my aunt, my aunt, my aunt says, yeah, Timmy's in the recovery room right now. And I woke up and I had these pimples around my chest and they said that I had died and that they revived me. Wow. Well, glad you got revived. Thank you for getting to the end of the story. And also, uh, thank you for hanging on as long as you did. A lot of people who are hanging on want to tell their story. and They'll get a chance to do it next on Ghost to Ghost. Let's keep them as short as we can and focus t- to the main meat of the story next on Ghost to Ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. Let's go to Lori, who's been waiting in British Columbia on the international line on Ghost to Ghost. Lori? Hi, Ian. Hi. Um, I will keep this one short, okay? About six years ago, I lived and worked out in, uh, like, a little uh, bed and breakfast. Um, there, like, there's a small restaurant and store. And uh, I worked there as a cook. <clears throat> and two years before I, I had even started working there, the previous owner had died of a heart attack um, right outside of the, of the kitchen. Anyways, I saw this guy everywhere. And one day, I was in the kitchen prepping out for dinner. And uh, there was not a soul in the restaurant or the store. It was really, really quiet. And I was working, like, on, um, like, the island in the middle of the kitchen, you know, doing prep work. And... Um, I hear somebody coming in through, from the restaurant into the kitchen, right in front of me kind of thing, like um, going through the push doors to get into the kitchen and lowering a tray of dishes and stuff. And I look up, and there's, <laughs> there's no one there. And the next thing I know, there's cutlery getting thrown at my head. Cutlery and, flying through the air. Yes. And two seconds later... Um, it was like somebody had walked around the island to, to right beside me and knocked everything off of the shelf. Okay, it, that's freaky. I know. It was really freaky. And and it, the origin of the flying cutlery, there is no other explanation nobody had. There was had, not a soul around. There was not a, a box of knives that were being balanced on a neighborhood seesaw or anything like that. They would have sent them. <laughs> But it was like a like a spoon and a fork came flying right across at my head. Wow. I know. Uh, and I ran out of the kitchen into the store and I was like freaked right out. I bet. <laughs> uh so did anybody has anybody else ever reported a similar incident? Yes. Yep. A lot of people have seen this this man that had passed away. Have they also been sporked like you where they had uh 
no, fly I cutlery? Was, no. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. I think it was for us. That was well worth you hanging on. I hope it was worth it for you too. It was so fun. thank, thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. That's Lori on the international line. Let's go to wild card line. Luke is in uh, Ducks territory. Are you a Are you a Ducks guy, Luke? I am. I that am was a, a. It was a very good game today. It was, it was an awesome excited, game. Got a lot of excited people in this town tonight. I, I was. Know. I was totally impressed, and, it, uh, and I I know that they're they're suffering down at uh, USC, but that was uh, that was some seriously cool football I was watching today. So way to go, yeah. Ducks! Yeah, well, hey, dig this. This is my ghost story. Okay, um, about fifteen years ago, uh, I was living in this basement in this house up here in Portland, and uh, there's no no windows or anything, and. Uh, I had a, a strand of Christmas lights that ran from one corner of the ceiling to the other corner of the ceiling. And in the center, I had attached them with a like piece of duct tape. So there was kind of a, you know, a, a, I don't know what you'd call it, but they were attached in the center of the ceiling, all right? So there was like two sort of bow type things. Anyways, I got into this, to this sort of meditation type of deal where I would sit in the center of my room, and I would sit in the in the middle of uh, of a circle of candles that I would light around myself, and I would put a candle right in front of me, and I would stare directly into it and just sort of zone out on it. And one night, I'm sitting down there, you know, in in the center of the candles, and for some reason, I started thinking about ghosts. And I just started really fixating on it, on just like asking in my, in my conscience, saying, if there's anybody here, show yourself, show yourself. I just kept saying that over and over in my mind. And after maybe about, I don't know, 15 seconds of doing that, that center strand of Christmas lights came unattached. And my Christmas lights started swinging back and forth in above me. Like I heard them drop mm. and then they just started swinging. And mm. that, that was the end of my ghost. Like that was the end of me thinking, Ooh, I wonder if there's any way that we can conjure up some spirits because right, I mean, right. there's, there's absolutely no way that, you know, because a lot of people have said, well, what, sure. you know, the tape just come undone, but not at that exact moment where I was At that saying, exact second. So here's my question. Do you think that was the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost <laughs> of Christmas present or future? I, I really don't know. I, <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't stick around. You didn't bother to stick around to ask a lot of questions. I don't play. No, I, I, I blew the candles out, turned my lights on and spent the night upstairs. That's very interesting. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate that. Great story. Let's get to Alan in Fresno, California on Ghost to Ghost. Alan? Really? Oh, really? Okay. Is that it? No. No second. No second act, Alan. Just. Uh... I am as glorious. Address me as Lord, as glorious. I will you, tell you. You are. I wait, 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 wait. You are Gasmosi. Gasmodius. Gasmodius. Asmodius. Asmodius. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I am in possession of Solomon's ring. I can command all of the demons. I am possessing a body tonight, but I this body is growing weak. I need your listeners to volunteer their soul to me. <laughs> you gotta do something about that. You gotta do me. Your soul. Uh, all right, very good. Thank you. Thanks for calling. And happy motoring. Uh, let's go to uh, Jim in Redlands, California on Coast to Coast AM. Jim? 
thank you, Ian, for being so gracious as to take my call. And if I could just say uh, thank you to my stepfather, Bob, who uh, turned me on to this show a couple of years ago. Um, Bob, was, you rock. Bob, yeah, you rock. He does. He does. Um, when I was a young boy, uh, maybe uh, 12 or 13, my uh, family, immediate family, moved to our family property in, in Northern California, and we uh, built a fort. And um, uh, I was uh, building... Uh, add-ons to the fort, and there was uh, a time where I was building up into the trees, and um, I'm looking out into the uh, forest that um, was abutted to the to the house, and uh, saw an older gentleman, and I thought it was my grandfather at the time, as he's walking near me, and uh, he was older, and uh, he had a well-worn and buckskin pants, and he was, uh, as he came closer, I, I identified him as, as a Native American, and it was so strange to me. I was like, well, what's this guy doing here? And he walked, and uh, t- later on, you know, I thought nothing of it. It was just weird that he was walking through our eucalyptus forest and told my dad about it, and uh, he said, oh, no, it's, it's, it's probably nothing, but, you know, just to be sure, let's just let's just check the property. And we went out and checked the property. Nothing was found. And several years later, um, I'd use the forest as a, as a, a bike trail to, to ride my bike through. And I saw the same character with, um, with a newer shirt, red and buckskin pants. And yet he, he was much younger and he looked at me and he smiled. And I just was like, Oh, the same guy. It's just. You no, know. oh, your your phone's going all asmodious on me. I uh, suddenly Jim went all asmodious. <laughs> disappeared in a haze of asmodium. <laughs> Sorry about that. We just and it was interesting too about the Indian and the guy. And I'm assuming he's he wasn't doing the same drugs that Jim Morrison was doing. So. I'm sure there's an end to that story, which we'll just have to imagine. Meanwhile, Julie is in Salt Lake City on Ghost to Ghost, west of the Rockies. Julie? Hi, how are you? Good. Happy Halloween. Thank you. I just want to know, is it a long-distance call for a demon to call? Uh, Tell me where Salt Lake City is in relationship to hell. (laughs) We're a little bit to the right and kind of to the north. Maybe local then. I don't know. but. (laughs) Um, my story is actually about my sister. My sister is a police officer, and um, she's a really tough girl. And in my whole life, I've probably seen her cry about ten times. So she and some friends heard about this haunted house that supposedly where this guy had committed suicide and the house was haunted. So she goes there, and several weeks later, I was at lunch with her, and she said to me, I have to ask you a question. I'm like, what? And she says, this thing has followed me home. I'm like, no. And she said, really? And I mean, she's getting teary-eyed over this whole thing. And I said, well, what do you mean it followed you home? And she said, it, I've seen it come out of my closet twice. And I said, were you sleeping? And she said, no, I was sitting up listening to the stereo And it came through the closet, and she said, it's a man, and he's got on a hat, and it looks like maybe a 100-year-old period dress and all this kind of stuff. And she was hysterical. She said, what do I do? And I said, well, you pray, and you have God make it leave. And she did, and it went away. So um, this last Memorial Day, we were going to um, clean off the officer's the fallen officers' graves and put flowers and stuff on their graves. And we were at a briefing breakfast prior to that, and they handed out little bios on the different officers who'd been who'd um, died in the line of duty. And they started talking about this one man who supposedly haunts this house. And she looks at it, and it was him. And she said, she looked at me, and I mean, she went white, and she's like. Julie, it's him. It's him. And that hmm. was the guy. 
And so instead of being scary and following her, he probably followed her because she was a police officer. Oh, that's so interesting. That is interesting, huh? Yeah. And and then any other recurrences? No, not after not after that at all. How about so. that? Uh, now, you t- talk to me about demons, though. Like, there's an interesting that this. Have you seen the movie Paranormal Activity? I did. Okay, and you know how they are discussing the difference between ghosts and demons, uh-huh. right? So, the, is there? And I was trying to get a feel for this from based on some previous callers too. Is with with a ghost like that? Suddenly, did her feeling about the experience change? Did she feel like it was less malevolent once she knew? the history to it or did she feel like it was it was still there was something that was coming after her at the time she felt like it was coming after her and she said to me this you know on memorial day she said you know maybe it wasn't maybe he was just coming because i was a police officer and he understood he thought i would understand who he was or something right she did feel differently about it this May than she did before. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and thank you. I appreciate that. I, it, I know I was throwing you kind of a curve by asking that, but I, I do think that's a, an intriguing question. Is when we feel like something is malevolent, do we? Does it change the way we perceive the experience from something ghostly to something demonic? And I, I never really quite understand the whole demonic thing in many respects, and I know this gets into a, a big cosmology issue and different theologies come into conflict about demons and such. But, um, you know, that's our, our ghost stories, generally speaking, don't end in somebody being hurt or killed. They just end up in somebody being startled or having sort of a paradigm shift. Um, demonic stories seem to take on a different twist. Unless, of course, it's like the previous caller, you know, Alan, where you have a demon named Alan. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Kentucky. Uh, who's uh, Jesse, who's on uh, the wild card line in Kentucky? Didn't pop up on the screen. Um, but I think, what's that? Patrick. Hello. Nick is in Kentucky. Hey, Nick. Yeah, it's Nick. Go ahead. We got about a minute for you. Will that be enough? Yeah, that's enough. Okay, so I had uh, just moved into my new apartment, okay? And um, I just settled down. It started, like, moving my stuff in. Laid down there the first night, and I could, like, hear this whispering. Some little kid, like, whispering to me, like, I've been diddled by the guy that hosts Coast to Coast. Oh, and, like, I knew on, he dude. was saying that. Oh, come on. Like, how hard is this, really? I mean, how drunk do you have to be for this to seem funny? (laughs) I hope that you bleeped him. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Come on, Kentucky. You can do better than Nick. Come on. I'm counting on you, Kentucky. Give me somebody better than Nick to represent your state. Love, Kentucky. Uh, let's get to uh, let's get to California, back up to Canada, Las Vegas. We're going ghost to ghost on Coast to Coast AM. That sounds good to hear that song. Johnny Cash and Ghost Riders in the Sky. You know, this was, I think they used it as a bumper last night too on, on Coast to Coast. Just love that song. And it reminded me that Roseanne Cash, his daughter, has a new uh, album out called The List. And it's a collection of songs that Johnny Cash once gave Roseanne Cash and said, these are the 100 essential songs uh, that you must learn to appreciate, I believe is kind of the understanding. In fact, that she had come from a rock and roll background. You know, Roseanne Cash grew up not so much in in the South or in, in Nashville, but rather around Southern California. And she was the head of the local you know, Beatles fan club and stuff. And so when she finally joined uh, her father on tour after he had gotten cleaned up from years of drug abuse and 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 she and he had reconciled enough to be able to, you know, perform together and, and have sort of this new relationship, he gave her the list 
of the songs for her to, to kind of to to go deeper into the into the country roots of the family business, as it were. And that's what the new album is about. It's uh, it's her favorite songs from the list. I have the album. It's tremendous. And if you're a Johnny Cash fan, I think you would enjoy hearing Roseanne Cash do those songs as well. So it's a selection, I think, of 12 of the 100 songs on the list. I hope it means there's another list album coming someday. And speaking of um, speaking of going back into the past, remember that tonight is the night we fall back. Spring forward, fall back for the daylight savings time. And 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 we will be falling back here on on coast to coast. Many of you listening in parts of the country that do not participate in daylight savings time, Hawaii, Arizona, parts of Indiana, we we will we will be falling back so far on the air that I will sound like Art Bell doing one hour of ghost to ghost. That's how freaky the interruption in the space-time continuum can be. So it could happen tonight that you'll be listening to Coast to Coast in certain areas of Hawaii, Arizona, and Indiana, and suddenly, as though you have entered in some sort of wormhole, we will hear Art Bell for an hour, and then we will come back to the show. I'm just telling you, be prepared. It's Halloween night. And anything can happen. And we also like to be kind of upfront with all the things that can happen on this show because we know that some people take the show very seriously. For example, that news story about the the guy in Iowa that walked up to somebody else in a in a store and, and punched him. You know, you heard the story. This happened right after we did a whole show about zombies on coast to coast. And then the, this news story came up about one guy walking up to another guy in a shop, accuses him of being a zombie and punches him in the face. And police are looking for that, that guy who, who punched the other guy. Just goes to show you the times we're living in, that somehow it's not even politically correct anymore to punch a zombie. You know, what, what have things come to this now that you see a zombie and you can't even punch him anymore? No, apparently not. Not even allowed to call them zombies anymore. It's the ambulatory deceased. So be careful, keep listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Ghost to Ghost on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Let's get to Jesse in Eureka, California on Ghost to Ghost. Jesse? Uh, hi. Thanks for waiting as long as you did. Yeah. Um, uh, my, aunt, my aunt Angel and I have a hide and seek ghost story. Um, um, we were at her house, and it was the middle of the day. We were playing hide-and-seek, and I was hiding in the bathroom counting while she was out hiding somewhere. And uh, when I was done counting, I opened the door, looked down the hall, and I saw her hair fling around the corner. And her hair is brown, long, and curly. So I ran over there to see if I can catch her. And I look around the corner, and I see her hair fleeing around the other corner that goes to the kitchen. So I I run over there, but she isn't there. And the curtains were moving that that lead to the deck. Mm -hmm. And I ran all over the house uh, trying to look for her, but she wasn't there. And um, here's her side of the story. So me, his aunt, was outside on the deck waiting for him to find me. And while I was waiting, all of a sudden, I, I see and hear this thunk on the glass sliding door of the deck, and I see the curtains moving all over the place. And I was thinking, oh, man, he found me, you know. So I was standing there waiting for him to come and get me, but he never came. So I opened the door, and I said, I thought you found me. You totally looked through the curtains. And he said, he said no, I thought you were in the house. See, I didn't even see you. And, I, you know, I thought you were in the house, but I wasn't. <laughs> and we both saw the same ghost at the same time. Hmm. Very interesting. And Jesse, that was the best impersonation of your aunt I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, there's two of you. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, interesting. Thank you. I'm getting a kind of a weird slapback echo, so I'm going to put you on hold, but that was cool. And, and especially, I wasn't expecting Jesse to break into or hand the phone over to his aunt in it. 
It's like suddenly it's like I survived on A&E or something. Cool. Don's in St. Louis. It's ghost to ghost. Hey, Don. Ian. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for hanging on. Uh, like you said a few minutes ago, anything can happen tonight. And it just yes. um, uh, I have a ghost story, and, uh, but actually in a kind of a paradoxical manner, it starts with two questions. I'd like to shoot at the audience if anybody has any wisdom uh, to either one of these. It might help me actually solve the mystery behind this. Uh, okay. My questions are brief. And what they are is this. I'd like to know if anybody knows if a person suffers from a fever, can that actually affect their ability to have a supernatural, any kind of supernatural phenomenon? Um, And my second question is, and of course, I don't think anybody would know because uh, after it happens, you know, how are you going to? How are you going to know? But people that have done research on this, maybe they would know. But uh, if a person uh, commits suicide as opposed to just dying, um, I'd like to know if anybody would really understand what kind of state that would leave them in in terms of being on the other side. Uh, the Bible never speaks of suicide as a sin. It doesn't uh, recommend that you do it. It doesn't recommend that you don't. So it's it's kind of a, a thing that I've always been curious of. Uh, and it kind of leads to my ghost story, which I'm going to right now, briefly. Um, my girlfriend and I uh, were sleeping right next to each other um, in her front room. Um, I was sick and I was running a low-grade fever. I was sleeping on the couch. She wanted and insisted to sleep on the floor next to me. I didn't feel, I felt a little guilty about that, but she didn't care. She wanted to. So I let her, and we went to sleep. About two hours later, I heard her kitchen back door, screen door, uh, open up with an eerie squeal. And I woke up and heard it. And right away, I reached down, and I start you know, touching your shoulder, said, uh, wake up, wake up, uh, you know, wake, wake up, you know, and finally she woke up and I said, there's somebody in your house and, and, and they're coming to this room and we heard heavy footsteps. And I say, we, because I'm the one with the fever. She was the one nursing me. She, uh, well, what happened was this, the footsteps got stronger as they came closer to the front room. Finally, a tall, what I would consider a male, hooded man in a dark trench coat stopped and looked at both of us. Neither one of us said anything back. Apparently, after about five minutes, it was satisfied with whatever its reason was, turned around and did a reverse of the entire thing. Now, we were both freaking, and of course, we went back to sleep, and the next day we checked with several of her friends to see if anybody stopped by in the middle of the night. She did have a couple uh, male friends that were uh, rather tall, so we asked them, and they were like, no, I, you know, usually I call when I come over. Um, so we never tracked it down. Finally, she never wanted to admit this to me, but she finally admitted to me that several years before I met her, her and some of her girlfriends practiced Wicca in the house, and she claimed that it was some kind of a shaman, a shaman, I meant to pronounce that correctly, uh, that uh, was basically just checking up on her and seeing if she was okay because I was a stranger, she said, and uh, he just wanted to make sure that I wasn't hurting her. And I, I was like, okay, I guess I'll have to buy that because I don't have any other choice. Um, and that's it, you know. Uh, hmm. But the weird thing about it was, uh, after this all happened, um, it left an eerie vibe. Um, the the okay. the, the uh, person or uh, the ghost, I would call him, uh, was not invisible like your typical ghost you see through. It was a solid figure, but nonetheless, uh, he didn't leave any negative impressions except that. Uh, what do you mean a solid figure? What do you mean well, I mean, you could not see through him like a, like a typical ghost. 
I mean, it, it was a solid figure in a trench coat with a tall, you know, tall and, and a hat. The shaman was. Well, she claimed he was. Yes. Okay. So that's and what I mean by solid, you know. So you could touch him. Well, I, I wouldn't want to. I was like twenty feet away on the couch. Right. But I'm assuming you could, and we heard yeah. the footsteps very clearly on, Plus, the har- on the hardwood floor. Plus, of course, there's that rule about you know. Do not squeeze the shaman. You know, you're not. Oh, oh, get away! But, uh, <laughs> now, yeah, I should. I brought that one back from the that, dead. That was that was good. But let me let me ask you though. And how does this? I mean, what are you looking for out of that suicide question? What, what is it that? I mean, I don't think I don't know if anybody will address it. But what is it that you're looking to find? Well, um, ever since that happened, um, my girlfriend she started acting sort of different, um, not towards me, but just in personality. Her idiosyncrasy changed a bit, and it was almost like she hinted towards wanting to join him, Hmm. and uh, so I took that as, you know, a suicide death wish, Uh, and I even blankly asked her one time, and, and she said, well, sort of, because he he wants to protect me, and I feel like He's trying so hard, I need to be with him. But I'm afraid to go to the other side because I don't know what lurks there. And I was uh-huh. like, okay, let's hope this uh, concludes the end of the entire relationship. <laughs> Everything. You know? yeah. uh, interesting, Don. Appreciate that. Thanks for sharing. Great stories. Let me get to uh, Jeff, Victoria, British yeah, Columbia on the international line on Ghost to Ghost. Jeff? Hi, how you doing? Terrific. Thanks. Happy Halloween. Yeah, happy Halloween. Uh, just to quickly answer uh, uh, the last caller's question about uh, uh, fever and spirits, uh, there was an episode of MASH where Klinger had a severe fever and he was interacting with a disembodied entity. Well, that, that settles that. And to get to my noise and nonsense, uh, when I was a kid, um, I, I lived in this uh, housing unit and... Um, we used to get uh, posters ripped off the walls. Uh, the hmm. toilet would flush in the middle of the night. Taps would turn on. Uh, at one point, uh, my mom's favorite mixing bowl went missing for two weeks. Just That's the, the realm of poltergeist, isn't it? The kind of practical joke playing spirits? Yeah, I, I believe that's what it was that was going on, yeah. Any history for why that would be happening to you? Uh, other than uh, there's a history of sensitivity in my family. Interesting. Uh, and nothing since then? Oh, well, I've had all sorts of things since then. Follow, no, no, following nothing, you nothing around? As, uh, pardon? Following you around, as it were? Uh, not really following me around, just incidents that occur that uh, could be paranormal. Like right now I work in a pub. Uh, I do cleaning at night, and it's supposedly got a ghost in it somewhere. Have you experienced that ghost yet? No, I have not. That opens the door for next year, then. And sharing that story next year, Jeff, if you get one, make sure you call us back on Ghost to Ghost. Patrick is in tugboat on a wild card line on Coast to Coast. Patrick? Hey, how's it going, Ian? Uh, yeah, I was uh, <laughs> I'm about three miles off Cape May. Uh... I was uh, in um, Freeport, Texas, at 19 years old, and I uh, just started working on this uh, crew boat. And uh, the guys had told me, <laughs> at first I thought they were pulling my leg, but they told me there that um, an engineer had died on board that boat. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was only 19, so, you know, but I was standing watch a few months later. And it was just a hot, it's one of them hot Texas nights in, in Freeport, man. And, uh, and um. And I'm uh, down there in the galley, and then I hear that door tag him open up, man, and and his footsteps just right across the uh, the deck. And uh, oh man, I run on up, you know, because I'm on watch, and you know I'm supposed to do that. So uh, I run up, and uh, and I run out that that same door that was closed, and uh, man, there was nothing out there. I mean, nothing, nobody. There was no way anybody could play a joke on the boat because. You know, because there's only one way in and one way out. But uh, oh man, I distinctly remember coming back in that um, 
into the uh, the area where I heard the boots and just that uh, it was like the AC was just cranked up. I mean, you know, I didn't know a lot about Coast back then, but man, I right. can, I'll never forget what that was like. You know, I think there's something unique about these, uh, whether it's a ghost ship or ghosts on a ship. There's something about that isolation of being out in the middle of the ocean, right? I <laughs> mean, that is just Nigeria now. You, you you are not able to, like, run down the sidewalk to a neighbor's house. There's not a whole lot you can do. That has just got to amplify the whatever experience you're having. Oh, man, I'll never forget that. That was the scariest thing I ever had. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Patrick, and be careful out there. And uh, let's get to uh, Andrew in Las Vegas on Ghost to Ghost. Andrew? Hello there, Ian. Uh, pleasure being on your show. Uh, I won't take too much time. Uh, my story is, goes back to uh, New Mexico. I'm originally from New Mexico, born and raised, and my dad is actually the one that told me this story. Uh, he said that uh, back in the day when he was younger, he used to like to go to, out dancing and, uh, and hang out with his friends. Well, they used to go uh, dancing to this certain uh, place in New Mexico. It was a dance hall. And uh, they were all dancing. The place was crowded. The man was playing, and they noticed this really tall man, an individual that was uh, dancing with, like, several women. All the women were very attracted to him for some reason. And they saw him from the top up. He was a very tall man, like I said. A bearded gentleman had, like, a, like a, I guess, like a top of suit, like a trench coat on, you know, type deal. And uh, one of the women, as they were dancing, as the night progressed, um, looked down. And uh, they were hearing all this tapping noise, you know, as he was dancing. They were going, you know, hearing, <laughs> and uh, they were wondering what's going on, you know. They thought maybe he had tap shoes. Well, one of the women that he was dancing with actually looked down and at this time noticed that he had hoof feet. And at the same time she saw his hoof feet, she turned around and said, oh, my God, or whatever she said. And everybody turned and looked, and a tail came out from the bottom of his jacket. And at that time... Uh, he turned, and it was just this big bang and a puff of smoke, and he left that whole place smelling like sulfur. The place had to shut down, my dad said, for like a month to try to get that sulfur thing out. But the weird part is... Oh, that's not weird enough? Here's the weird part? Okay, go ahead. (laughs) They've never been able to clean that floor. Uh, very interesting, you know, and I, I take it on your dad's word because I know your dad would never tell you something that isn't true. Uh, there is a history a bit to that story, which we'll get back to then coming up in our final hour of Ghost to Ghost on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Heading into our last hour of Ghost to Ghost, and I just want to start by picking up where we left off with Andrew's story. He was sharing a story from New Mexico. Now, I don't know what Andrew's parentage is. He talked about his father, and I don't know whether uh, there is uh, any Mexican-American family tradition for Andrew. But the story he told reminded me of a story that I had heard from somebody else who identified it as a Mexican cautionary tale. The story Andrew told about something his father said had happened at a dance hall with a uh, tall movie star, handsome stranger who was at this dance, uh, who was, you know, being celebrated by three or four women at the same time, dancing with him, high level of animal magnetism. Everybody's paying attention to this guy, and then they realizing the the clacking that they're hearing on the dance floor are not his shoes, but of hooves, and that there's a poof and a disappear, and then the smell of sulfur. And they've never, you know, took them a long time to get the smell of sulfur out of the dance hall, and then the the burn in the floor is still there. Now, could be totally unrelated. Not saying Andrew's dad isn't being truthful, but that story has been around for a long time. Uh, And in fact, uh, there's a Canadian version of that. uh, And there's a very interesting and I think similar sounding Mexican version of that. I'll share with you in just a second. 
Uh, but it, it, they all share a similar theme, except for what Andrew hadn't mentioned was whether or not there was a significance to the dance. In that, in some versions, I hear it's a, a dance that's being held on a Sunday. So this was a cautionary tale for no dancing on Sunday. Uh, uh, And sometimes it's uh, presented as a a dance during a holiday season where one was intended, uh, you know, to be more observant of a a somber mood, say, for example, during Lent um, or during the Easter season. uh, And or it's just a cautionary tale like this one. Uh, This one actually comes directly from Mexico, uh, and the version of the story I will read verbatim. Uh, It says here, it was submitted by a woman who said, This story was told to me by my grandmother. It happened when she was about 40 years old. She was at a wedding dance, newly divorced, still very attractive. She was approached by a dark-haired gentleman, very tall and attractive. She described him as looking like a movie star. He walked up to her wearing a long black overcoat and held out his hand. She said he never spoke a word, but she was so amazed that this handsome man wanted to dance with her that she accepted. She said that he was an incredible dancer, very strong. He whispered for her to come outside the dance hall with him and come to his car. Luckily, my grandmother wasn't that kind of a lady. She refused, and he simply stopped in the middle of the dance floor and walked out. Now, my grandmother was turning to go back to her seat when her friend ran up to her and began pointing at the departing stranger. And that's where they saw, below his pants, black shoes had now become black hooves. The black hooves were below red, hairy legs, and swishing underneath the rim of his jacket was a long, red, hairy tail with a red tip. And the man turned to them as if he had sensed them and held up a finger shh, to his mouth and then gave them a wink and left. My grandmother used the story to re- warn me that the devil comes in many guises, including those of incredibly handsome and dashing men. And she's never forgotten her dance with the devil. Well, just adding that onto our Halloween night fair. Not exactly a ghost story, but a good one nonetheless. And what did really, though, happen to you? That's what makes these stories so special. And we'll get back to them next. More of Ghost to Ghost. This is Ian Punnett. All right, let's uh, let's just tell you up front, we've got a guy calling from China that I will get to sooner as opposed to later. Craig is in Utah, however, on Ghost to Ghost. Craig? Hello. How Happy Halloween. Doing? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, my story started about, I guess, about 20, 22 years ago. My son and I was going deer hunting. I had to work a little late, and we was going up to a cabin on the mountain where my dad and a bunch of his friends, was, people were up there camped already. We got there a little late in the evening, and uh, we just went in and went right to bed in a cot in the hallway. And I got him tucked in, and I lay in there and lit up a cigarette. This little boy come walking up to the side of me there. I looked over at him, and I asked him, what are you doing, little fella, looking for the bathroom? He didn't say anything. He just kind of turned around and went over into the bedroom where my sister was sleeping. And a couple minutes later, this uh, lady got up, come walking by us in there in the hallway, and went downstairs. And a couple minutes later, she come walking back past us. A few minutes later, a man walked by us and went downstairs, come back up past us, and I stopped the man and asked him if he had a little boy in there. I thought he was lost. He looked like he was looking for the bathroom. He didn't said they didn't have no children with him. Mm. I found that just quite amazing. I got to thinking about it after that, and I didn't really see any feet on the little guy. He just kind of floated away. So, hmm. Man, just to my mind, there's no doubt in my mind, I was wide awake, smoking a cigarette, and that little fella was no more than a foot and a half face to face with me. How about that? And uh, and that was the end of it. There's nobody that came through later on. Have you seen this child? Nothing? Nobody making never, any claim? Never anything again. The only thing was on the way into the cabin, there was a sharp turn on the road on the way in there, and there was two little white crosses there. I got asking about them the next day, and there was two young boys that died there a few years ago in a camper that flipped over. 
Mm. Well, Craig, that's that's very interesting and always sad when the the ghosts are children. But fascinating. Thank you. And Connie is in Tucson on Ghost to Ghost. Connie? Good morning, Ian. Happy Halloween. Thank you. Well, about 14, 13, 14 years ago, I was back east with a friend, and we were just traveling around. And I came back early and left her back there. And I, it was about 11, 11.30 at night. I was house-sitting for her. And I decided it was time to turn the light out and go to bed, which I did. And I was lying there, not asleep yet, because I had just climbed in bed, started to settle in. And all of a sudden, the middle of the bed, it was a sofa bed. It had that chicken wire, whatever, looked like pig wire, whatever, kind of springs. And it went creep. And right in the middle of the bed, under me, the whole bed lifted up. And then it creaked right back down. And I thought, what in the world? Mm. And about that time. I heard what sounded like heavy drumming of your fingers. Right. Uh, like on a card table. It was ho- a loud, hollow drumming. That went on for quite a while, and I kind of got my wits together, reached over and turned on the light, and the drumming kept going. So I said, who's here? It's just drumming. Who's here? Just kept drumming. I said, whoever you are. Whatever your problem is, I, I'm, I tend to be a bit clairvoyant. I, I think you're a, a boy, 12, 13 years old. It was about midnight, so it was kind of weird and, you know, strange. Right. And I said, do you need to find your way? If you do, just look around and you'll see a light. You walk into that light, and there will be someone there to meet you. Hmm. Well, the, and? and the drumming stopped, and he left. Well, I'll be darned. That's interesting. You know, I, that's a probably good advice for anybody that, um, thank you, Connie, for, like the, the story we had earlier from somebody who was doing construction, home construction, and they were having a ghost there, or anytime, you might as well say, hey, if you see a light, go to it. Maybe, maybe that's the first time they've ever gotten that advice. I mean, if that's really what happens and that people can't seem to find the door to the next dimension or to the next level of, of experience, of spiritual experience, uh, you know, who knows? Very interesting. Thank you. Michael is in China on Ghost to Ghost. Hey, Michael. Hi, Ian. Thanks for taking my call. And uh, good afternoon from the Middle Kingdom. It's uh, already... 19 here so well tell okay, me well, about my... what wait what what brings you to sure. china uh well look uh like a lot of americans i was i just had that uh, middle class malaise and i said man i gotta get out and try something else so uh i, I took a, a leap into the deep end and uh boy there was an abyss right below me but uh i came to china and i taught english for a year of all things and uh, right now, uh, I've gotten into some consulting business with uh, another American that I met here, and it's it's going pretty well. I, I enjoy my time here. Is uh, is are there many other Americans that you bump into, and how is your Chinese? Uh, you know, my Chinese is is pretty good. Uh, I'll say da jia ni hao, ni men hao. That just means basically um, uh, everybody hello. Okay. Um, at any rate. The American population here, I'm in South Central China. I'm in a big city called Chongqing. It's the biggest city you never heard of. And um, uh, no, I don't see a lot of Americans here. The, the population of expatriates in different countries is only about 10,000. And uh, the total city population is maybe 5 million. So. How about that? Very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. So is this a ghost story of what happened to you in China? No, actually, it's not. Uh, this is a story that happened to me when I was uh, really very young. And uh, so what happened was, uh, from the time I was very young, I had a very clear, vivid memory of uh, late one night, I was in my crib, and something woke me up. And look, look through the bars of my crib, past my feet, and at the window, I see this shadow, and it is pure black. It absorbs light. And the eyes were the most striking feature they were radiant bright white and it's looking right at me and this entity puts its 
right hand to the window as if to say, I'm watching you. And in a two-year-old fashion, uh, I, 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 I was able to determine I was two years old at the time. I stuck my tongue out at this thing, and I put the blanket over my head. I paused, pulled the blanket back down. Now it's inside my room looking down at me over the crib. I put the blanket back over my head, and I wait for morning. I, I fell asleep at some point. Well, I was able to figure out that I was only two by describing the layout of the room to my parents because, you see, this memory is so vivid that everything about the features of the room I was able to remember along with this memory. I described the room to my parents, and they said, well, you would have been about two years old at that time. I finally told the story to my mother when I was 10, and she kind of withdrew from me for a couple of days, and I finally got her to open up. She told me that a year prior to my memory, when I was only one year old, that my bed at that time was in her room with her and my father. And she said she woke up one night to the sound of me shivering as though I were very cold. She looked down to my crib and she saw this black shape. She said it looked like a man, but it was completely black as if it were absorbing light. And she said that it, that it was looking down into my crib and it stood up and it had these two white, radiant, bright white eyes. And it was the same thing that I saw at a totally different time. And she said that it seemed upset that it, she saw it, and she said that it took about three steps backwards and, and melted into the wall, just completely disappeared. And the experience for her was so out of context, she didn't know how to react, so she just went back to sleep. But what's interesting for me is that you can say that, well, what I experienced was just some sort of a bad dream or, you know, a two-year-old fantasy uh, but the reality is, is that she saw a year prior the exact same entity in almost the exact same context, hmm. and uh, I thought it was a very interesting confirmation of a very bizarre experience for myself. That's, that is interesting, and, and the fact that it is intergenerational, too, and in, in different uh, time frames, but, but overlapping. So thank you, Michael, all the way from China. That just goes to show you the reach of ghost to ghost. We're going from the west ghost of the United States all the way to foreign ghosts. Uh, Diane is in Illinois on Coast to Coast AM. Hey, Diane. Happy Halloween, Ian. And you too. Boo. Boo. Um, mine is a relative ghost, and we have a basement. The stairs are carpeted. Halfway down the stairs is an opening where the carpet overlaps. Ever since I was a toddler and first went down the basement stairs, I would stop halfway down, open that little carpet flap, look under the stairs, and if I didn't see a shadow of anything, I'd go down the stairs the rest of the way. And when I was 11, I went down the stairs, went behind the stairs, and ran smack into this ghost. Argyle sweater, pinstripe pants, um, saddle shoes, Glasses, bald man, sort of short, little chunky. Didn't recognize him, didn't know anything about him. You know, went upstairs. My mom was doing dishes, and I said, anybody die in this house? And hmm. she said, your grandmother's brother died of a heart attack looking out the living room window watching the sunset. Now, the living room window is directly above that area where he was behind the stairs, and I knew he was there ever since I was a wee, wee little girl. And I mm. would always stop halfway down the stairs and open that flap and see if it was clear because I always had this little heebie-jeebie feeling. Sure. And when I saw him and he disappeared in front of me, mm. never felt his presence again. He just wanted to be seen by somebody. And you wouldn't open the flap, so he had to come to you. 1954. 1954 is when he died. I was born in 1967. Hmm. That's really interesting. And I, I love the description of the clothing, too, and the fact that, uh, that right away it, there was a, an explanation. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate that. Another great ghost-to-ghost -ghost story, true story on a wild card line. Is it, am I pronouncing this right, Hinkle in Las Vegas? Yeah, that's right. Just wanted to first start off with a long-time listener, first-time caller. Happy Halloween. Um, thank you. Happy Halloween to you, too, even though it's now the first. Um, so anyway, my story uh, begins when uh, I get home from work at about 9 o'clock at night. 
And normally I just sit around my apartment and watch TV. And uh, I was in a new uh, house that I just started renting. And I was just watching movies about midnight. And I swear I hear someone in my room. And I live in kind of a bad part of town. So I always lock the windows and doors just because I don't want anyone to break in. And so I go and investigate the noise. And in my room, there's this beautiful woman wearing this long, silken, flowing robe. And I'm just dumbstruck. I can't even speak. Um, and I start just trying to think, like, what, what is this woman? Who is she? I've never seen her before in my life. And before I could say anything, she comes up to me and starts kissing me and caressing me. And we ended up making love that night. And I say it's probably the best experience of my life. But as soon as I was done climaxing, bam, she was gone and disappeared. And come to find out about three months after that incident that the house I was renting actually used to be in a legal prostitution ring and that the person that was running it, madam, ended up dying violently in uh, a deal gone wrong. So you think that the madam, even after death, was still turning tricks? Um, I, well, I didn't pay, but yeah, I think so. <laughs> the spirit uh, was strong. You don't ask a lot of questions, do you, when it comes to sex? I uh, just, I couldn't, it was, she was beautiful, and I just couldn't speak. I was, like I said, you were, I good, was, you were good to go. I was, uh, I was. And, uh, and thank you, Hinkle, I appreciate that. Uh, some people would say that story is a little hinky, but I would say no. Uh, that's like a, a lot of guys' fantasies. That's the perfect sort of, you know, letter to penthouse sort of fantasy. I never thought this would have happened to me. And for a lot of guys, that's just what they want, you know. The woman to come on to them, uh, for them to finish, and then she disappears. <laughs> that's like For some people, that's a dream relationship. Uh, and uh, and yet, with another half hour to go, who knows what more we might still hear as Ghost to Ghost continues on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Last half hour of our original feed here for Ghost to Ghost. I say, I say that because, of course, for many stations there will be a replay, and for some there will even be another hour. That'll be added to the show because of the, the the time change tonight. We're falling back. We may already have fallen back in whatever market you're in. And there's even a very high percentage uh, of a chance I'm hearing right now that you're not hearing me right now. That there has been some sort of interruption along the line, ghost to ghost. And that the the stations that are ordinarily carrying this broadcast right now aren't carrying it. Some people are still listening online, obviously, but there is something that has happened. I don't know what spirit we may have offended, or maybe it's just a satellite problem, or maybe it's a technical problem with the time change. Nobody's quite certain, except that we're working on it. And everybody who's hanging on right now, we will get to you. Uh, and, uh, And we'll get to you between now and the top of the hour. Thank you for hanging on during this period, even though a lot of stations are down along the network. And we look forward to other people being able to hear this later on in the podcast. If you don't have Streamlink, uh, you should get it. And here's the reason why. Exactly what you're experiencing right now on Ghost to Ghost AM. This is Ian Punnett. First time caller line, Max, has been hanging on in Navato, California on Coast to Coast or Ghost to Ghost tonight. And happy Halloween, Max. Happy Halloween, Ian. Um, I'm just calling tonight to tell you a story that happened about 11 years ago to me. Um, I was about eight years old then, and I was living in a different house in Novato, and it was on the upper uh, floors, and there's nobody else around. So um, at about 3 a.m. every night for a week until I moved from that house, I would wake up, and there would be a knocking at my door. And it would pause for about three seconds in between, but there would be a loud knock at the door. And it was definitely a knock. It wasn't just house sounds. And uh, for about 11 years, I didn't really know what that was, and I had looked it up on the Internet everywhere. And um, what I had come to uh, believe is that it might have been a demon. Just going back to um, I had seen paranormal activity recently. Right. And how they had uh, gone into you have to... um, agree to let it in 
And uh, that's also from what I've read online. The only other people who've had this experience, uh, that's, um, they say the people who have en- opened that door for uh, whatever it was on the other side of that have um, run into demon problems down the line. And hmm. um, you had so, uh, meant, you know, No, go ahead. No, no. Oh, so you had mentioned earlier you weren't exactly sure what a, your definition of a demon might be. And I think paranormal activity covered that pretty well, um, just in the way they describe it as a, a, it's not a human spirit, but anything that's uh, got the um, kind of poltergeist activity associated with it, and it feeds off um, the imagination and the belief in it. And the more belief that you have in it, um, the more powerful it becomes. And uh, at that time, I had done some things that, probably weren't the smartest things being an eight-year-old. Spells were really cool. So I had gotten some books from the local library, some cult books, and uh, <laughs> I'd been playing you, around with that. <laughs> when you were eight years old, you had done this? Yeah, I had a weird kind of family thing because <laughs> I had my Florida grandparents, which are uh, the real religious uh, Baptist types, and um, my Southern California grandparents, which were the atheists <laughs> of the family. So I was kind of looking somewhere in between for that. And I wasn't so aware of halfway in between atheism and Southern Baptists is the occult. <laughs> well, it, it, it wasn't, um, I wasn't thinking that it would be no, the I demon understand. side of that. You know, it's more of the spells, you know, you're a kid, you think, well, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. But. So, uh, interesting. So, yeah, I think it's fair enough. I mean, I think the, the movie, uh, I don't want to put too fine a point on their definitions and paranormal activity in fact i even went back and i looked up some things and i don't know that everybody would agree with those but it is a great starting point for a conversation and worthy of seeing and i'm almost afraid of giving too much of that movie away because i i enjoyed it i wasn't terrified by it it wasn't movies just don't scare me but it it had some pretty good moments in there you know a couple of good kind of moments and if you if you like that kind of a movie this is a great weekend to see it kim is in sacramento on ghost to ghost kim Hello. Hi. Hi, good morning. And to you. I, I wanted to tell you a story of the first apartment that I lived in. It was uh, actually in Stockton. Um, it was a 1920s four-story brick building. It had an elevator that was broken, so we lived on the fourth floor, and we had to walk up the stairs uh, to get to our apartment, and we're actually leaving our apartment Um we got down to the second floor, and I realized I forgot the cell phone, so my boyfriend went down to the car, and I went back up for the cell phone. Um, I walked into the apartment, and I was looking around. And I found it on the bed and went to grab it. It was a studio apartment, and so my, my television was right there next to my bed. And as I grabbed the cell phone, I turned her back around to go towards the door. Um, the television was behind me with this uh, this lamp that we had right on top of it, and directly across the room, which would be at my face, was... Uh, a very large mirror, and uh, as soon as my eyes came up and and saw the mirror, I saw the lamp coming at me um, straight across the room like it was going to hit me, and uh, it actually was an, an, uh, it looked to be uh, an old oil lamp, but it it actually was electric and had a cord connected to, um, was plugged into a circuit breaker um, that had a bunch of other stuff uh, plugged into it. And uh, as soon as it hit, um, I guess, the extent of the lamp's cord, um, I saw this in the mirror. It, the light bulb busted uh, right in midair, right behind me, and it fell to the floor, and I heard a big crash, and I flipped around to look at it, and it had broken in half. And the if you can picture, like, the bottom of an oil lamp, the larger part, Right. Um, it, should, it should be hanging from a cord. Um, you know, it was it was coming from behind the television, and it was it was kind of hanging in front of the television. And and the bottom part, the larger part, should be hanging from the cord, but it's actually above the bottom of the cord, and it was swinging back and forth. And I was kind of just frozen there, pitch black in the dark in this old building. And I just looked at it, and I freaked, and I ran all the way, but all the way downstairs. All the way to the, and my boyfriend said, it was like you've seen a ghost. And I just, I couldn't even say anything. And right. then we actually, uh, uh, we stayed.
stayed gone for two days. I was so freaked out. We came back after two days to move out, and I realized that it had been exactly one year. It was the night before uh, we had moved in one year ago when this happened. And when I got back, um, we were moving all our stuff. I had a guitar that was next to a window, and this guitar was it was out of tune. And I don't know if you know when a guitar is um, in a temperature where, you know, if it's cold, the, the strings go out of tune. Right. Um, and I had it I had it by this window for three weeks, and it was kind of out of tune. And then I had tuned it, like, a week before this happened. And I picked up the guitar after we went back to the apartment, and it was horribly out of tune. I picked up my guitar tuner, and every single note from E to E was exactly exactly one note flat and it was a real really bad guitar mm. i couldn't i had a hard time even getting it to the notes it was exactly one note flat and the house was extremely cold and it was mm. just the weirdest thing i had that had ever happened to me which is uh, what caused me to uh to start believing yeah but well, uh, i mean that uh, interesting i mean that very particular thing about the guitar but that that's even, that's something that uh that's very intriguing that if it was just that much off and i love the fact that these stories that we're hearing tonight on ghost to ghost all tend to go in different directions and let's see where hillary takes us from encino california you're on ghost to ghost hillary yes hi ian Happy Halloween. And to you, too. Um, well, back in uh, 2002, on Halloween night, um, I had been giving out candy for, you know, hours, and finally it was about 9.30, and it slowed down. I thought, well, that's it. I think that's going to be the end of giving out any candy. I'll close everything up. And as I looked out my front window across the towards across the street where my neighbor had his light on, I saw what looked like a child in black, all in black. It sort of was about three and a half feet tall, three feet tall. Uh, It even looked like it came to a point on top as if it might have a witch's hat on. And I I thought, my goodness, there it is. And this this little child is sitting, is uh, right behind the neighbor's car in the driveway, but there are no adults anywhere around. So I went to the porch, and I looked out again, and I looked up and down the street to see if there were some adults, and there was no one. And so then I walked out onto the lawn, and I got closer and closer, and this uh, this creature or this um, phenomenon was still there behind uh, the taillight of my neighbor's car. And um, it was black, totally black. uh, You couldn't see through it. And uh, as I approached the um, sidewalk and then down to the curb, I was now getting very close. And all of a sudden, as I was probably about, I would say, eight yards away from uh, from the the character, the creature, whatever, um, it just swish it went, went whoosh like that and went right around the back of the car in in, in a sweeping manner um sort of like something that you would uh, computer generate you know mm-hmm. um and it went uh, around the the side of the car up towards the garage towards the house and um, the movement was completely inhuman there's nothing that could ever move that way and I was really close enough to see that this wasn't anything that was wrong with my vision. I mean, this wasn't something that was manifesting from my eyes. Right. Uh, so I thought, oh, my gosh, where did it go? I looked around the cars. I looked up towards the garage and the gate to the backyard, and I couldn't see anything there. But it had, had no chance to go right or left. So I went to my neighbor's door, and I said, will you check your backyard? to see if there's a little kid back there. And he thought I was nuts. And he said, okay, okay, okay. And he went back and he checked it and there's nothing back there. And Hmm. so then I told him what I saw. And of course he thought I was 
taking something <laughs> well, <laughs> or doing something and right. drinking. <laughs> well, but you weren't. And like no, I a wasn't. Lo- no. Right. Of course you weren't. Well, very good. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you for hanging on. We have a couple other people we'll get to before the top of the hour, like Mike, who's in Louisville on Ghost to Ghost. Mike? How you doing? Doing all right, Mike. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween to you, sir. I finally got through to you guys. I've been trying for weeks to get a hold of you all. I've got a great story for you. This goes back probably, wow, close to 20 years, back when I was about 11, 12 years old. Uh, We used to have all the kids in my neighborhood come over, and we'd have little slumber parties at our house and things like that. And uh, I was the guy that always liked to try to scare everybody with some kind of silly story and things like that. And there was a little old lady whose yard backed up against ours, and she was kind of really reclusive and didn't talk to many people and things like that. So, you know, she was a really easy target for me to make up stuff about her just to scare my friends and things. And this one night we're sitting around, and I was telling them that, you know, she was a witch and things like this. And at night, if you go over to her bedroom window, you kind of sometimes hear her, you know, doing these really weird chants and things like that. So I had him really convinced of this whole, you know, silly story. And I snuck out the backyard, and I was going to sneak up to the back of her window and let them think that, you know, something was going on, and they're all sitting there waiting for me to, you know, tell them what's going on. Well, I get maybe 20 feet from the back of her house. Yeah. And this, this is like, you know, 1 in the morning, something like that. And all of a sudden, the window blind goes flying up, and this light, turns on at the bedroom, and it scares the bejesus out of me. I take off running across the yard. I fly past my friends. We run into the basement, and we're hiding down there, and everybody's freaked out, and I'm more freaked out than anybody because, you know, I was I was full of it, you know? Sure. And uh, so as the night goes on, we keep looking out the back window, and sometimes the light in the bedroom's on, sometimes it's off. Sometimes the blind is all the way down. Sometimes it's up. It was just really, really weird. Well, I mowed grass for like a a summer job, and and her grass was one of the lawns that I had mowed. And at the end of the week, I was mowing the grass, and her sister kind of came and checked on her and would pay me to, to mow the grass and things. And at the end of the week, she came and she paid me, and she said, hey, you know, we'd like you to keep on mowing the grass until we get the house sold. And I said, oh, and I I thought maybe, you know, she was, you know, moving or maybe maybe they were putting her into an old folks home or something like that. Sure. And I asked how she was, and she said, oh, you didn't hear that she had passed away. And I said, no, when? And she says, about two weeks ago. And I said, no, that can't be. And she says, no, it was about two weeks ago, but, you know, we want you to keep mowing the grass. And I said, no, no, and I said, you know, we were spending the night, and we had this summer party last, you know, last Friday right. night. And right. This light came on in her bedroom and everything. I said, has anybody been in the house? Because I thought maybe somebody had, had broke in and was snooping around or anything. Sure. And she said, she said, no, nobody broke in or anything, but it can't be that weekend you're talking about. And I said, no, 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 it was. And you know houses that don't have the ceiling lights in the, in the rooms, and they just have a plug yeah. and a right. light switch, and you have to have a floor lamp? Well, they had already cleared out a lot of her stuff, and she said her bedroom had no light in it whatsoever. So I still, to this day, have no clue what this light was, what was going on in this room, or anything. How about that? Wow. And and uh, that might fall into the orb category. Yeah, um, I have it, no idea. But it's it still, you know, I still have no idea. And, and Right. Well, take a look at that online. You might be the ghost orb, the ghost light, um, you know, the non-human form, but the bright light. And very interesting. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. And and a great way to almost end the show tonight. We have to lead that probably up to Lonnie, who will take us up to the top of the hour for Ghost to Ghost. Lonnie? Good morning. Boo to you. I was in uh, radio for approximately 40 years, and the uh, radio station owner was killed in an accident, and I was the only one in the building one night uh, sometime after that, and something spoke my name at the front door. Of course, I was in the very very back corner of the building, and there was nothing there. I saw nothing. Uh, Another time, I 
was working on something and felt his presence standing over my shoulder. Um, there are a number of other things, light switches going on and off, and others had seen this also. Um, something else more recently, a um, member of my church uh, had had very serious mental problems over the years and tried suicide a number of times and uh, finally killed himself. And I'd always meant to call and go by and visit him, sure. but just never got around to it. But one night, I just, in my spirit, heard him say, it's all right. There was nothing you could have done. And uh, as I said, I've never seen a ghost, but I have felt felt them being around. I used to go camping a lot in the campsite where I used to camp. I never felt alone, although there may be nobody else around for 100 yards, but later found out that someone had died at that in that campsite. So uh, I'd like to become more in tune with uh, the spirit world in in sure. understanding more. But uh, well, you certainly I, had have had a lot of experiences as a as a head start, Lonnie. And the great way to wrap us up to say there's wouldn't it be nice if every ghost came back to give us good news? Well, it's tough to leave it right there. Thank you, everybody, who made this show so special tonight. These are your stories, captured forever. Ghost to Ghost AM. They use Tamont, and I do too.